round two. Fight! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first semi-final of the Fire 2 Open. My name's Lumen, and casting with me today is Daniel, also known as Crabmaster John. Hey, Lumen. I can't tell you how unreasonably ex excited I am for this game. This is going to be an absolutely incredible game of Terra Mystica, and I just, you know, it's such a pleasure to be casting, such a pleasure to be casting with you. Uh, how are you feeling right now? I am super excited for this, honestly. Uh, I thought I was prepared for this cast, but I just got super pumped. And uh, hopefully we'll be following it along uh, well, providing some accurate commentary, if not entertaining. Um, did I have that reversed? Maybe I did. Uh, but definitely looking forward to it. How about you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I I'm definitely pushing for the entertaining commentary because I have a feeling that accurate won't always be possible. But I mean, this is just, we're at a point in the tournament now where there's so much going on. There's so much to play for. Uh, there are two spots in the finals that are riding on the results of this game. And, you know, there's just, uh, we have so many people in this game as well that qualified through qualifiers. Um, as that, that you know it's just the kind of game that you have to get pumped for and you have to be really excited to, to see how it plays out absolutely i completely agree it's a wonderful showing of how this tournament system is a success um and uh here's the bracket for the tournament we have uh our fire division semi our, our fire division final right now as you can see as daniel mentioned we have two advancers from this game and that will make a huge impact on how this game is played. We will try to analyze that as best we can for you. We yeah, have Soros, Rickery, Gino, and Claybo. <laughs> Let's see. We have um, the best factions and preferred factions coming up shortly here. Yep, they're the best factions in the past 50 games for each player. What do you make of this, Daniel, if anything? Um, well, the first thing that jumps out to me right off the bat is that Zorus' best faction in the last 50 games is Giants, a faction that he's notoriously uh, lukewarm on even seeing in his games in the first place. So that by itself, I think, is really cool. Um, we also don't see Engineers represented on anybody's board here in the past 50 games. And engineers are sort of notorious for being ubiquitous in Terra Mystica. Um, so th those are the things that stand out to me just like right off the bat. What about you? Uh, I agree that uh, the lack of engineers is a bit surprising. Uh, the fact that Zorus's best factions include giants and Rickery's don't make me feel like something is up with these. Uh, we might have insight for you all later on that. But otherwise, th this is just like all black, brown, gray, no green, no red. Uh, we'll see if those factions pop up in the auction at all. I guess giants are red, but apart from that, not a very uh, rainbow-like showing right. there. But interestingly, now that we're looking at the preferred factions, we do see green better represented. Um, yeah. And where mermaids were present on the previous screen, uh, now there's only swarmlings. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's there's definitely a diverse array of factions that these players are capable of of playing at a high level. Um, one of the interesting things, again, about Zorus uh, specifically, and then also Claybo on this shot, is that we see nomads present in their preferred factions. But uh, there's a really interesting division in the yellow factions, especially when landscapes are in play. And you're a player who plays for Kears a lot. So I think that it would be really cool when we go into the actual game to see like what sort of considerations you think of when you think of whether or not a game is a good for Kears game versus Nomads, given the inclusion sure. of landscapes. Yeah, and and that we uh, that these games are played with landscapes absolutely makes a huge difference in how these factions get played. Um, Fakirs, Swarmlings, Dwarves, 
definitely get affected by their landscape in terms of gameplay. Cultists and witches and halflings certainly less so. Um, and we will try to break that down for you all. So in terms of being prepared for this game, we do have some words from these uh, contestants as they, as they, as they, uh, I guess, prepared mentally, tried to scare everyone else off, play mind games. We see this match history. I think there's one thing that really jumps out to us. Would you like to expand on that? Yeah, so the the things that jump out are that there's a lot of games played, especially between Zorus and Claybo, but uh, there was a lot of... Tra the thing I want to comment on the most is that there was a lot of trash talking, surprisingly, before the game started, and the source of most of the trash talking came from Zorus, which I'm sure everybody... Uh, is going to be extremely surprised to hear because prior to, to this bout, he has always come across as a consummate gentleman. But it turns out that he was very much like um, one of those anime characters who hides his true potential for fear of what he could uh, unleash upon the world. And he came with some like grade A trash talk today um, that was just really explosive. He said that <laughs> he said he said that he didn't think that. <laughs> that Claybo could could beat him in his current state. He said that Rickery basically got carried by the other players interfering with one another. Uh, just... Yeah, this was... Fire believable. Uh, and I, I completely agree. We thought Zorus was a gentleman, but uh, he has some more sinister capabilities, it turns out. Uh, as, as you've worked with him in the past, casting these games, uh, that might have been a shock to you as well. Yeah, oh yeah, that, that caught me way off guard. Um, yeah. So just looking at the match history, uh, Zorus has played the most games with everyone, and he does have a winning record. And so um, that, I think, is adding to the sense that a lot of people are getting before the game starts up, which is that Zorus is sort of the favorite. One mm -hmm. other interesting thing to mention about that is that, especially if you look at the players who are going to be in the ice division final, those are they are, those players are all super experienced, like old Snellman heads have played tons of games over the years. Very and on, everywhere, yeah. And on this side of the bracket, the only player who's really representative of that old school Snellman community is Zorus. Everybody yeah, else here yeah. is sort of like a homegrown BGA li live player who very recently has come up through the tournament. So, you know, that I think is, is like an exciting dynamic as well in this game. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and we could say this sample size is still kind of small and it doesn't matter very much. But we also see, you know, Rickery's never beaten any of these people. And uh, I'm very proud of him for how he did in his, his group game. I mean, that was such a, such a great victory for him. And while I'm going to be root for my previous co-caster, uh, this would suggest his odds aren't high. Yeah. But if you talk to production, pr production swears that Rickery is going to win and that Gino is actually the one who is a massive underdog. So, you know, there's a lot. I think we're starting to see the emergence of people like, you know, having intuitions about different people's play styles. And like, I know a lot of people were really confident about how Gino was going to play in his group stage game, and then he ended up winning. So I think that there's, a, there's this dynamic that's forming where, like, the match history here, people are just really willing to just throw it out the window instantaneously. They're like, you know what? This doesn't mean anything. Like, I know yeah. that this player is going to do really amazing, or, like, I'm fully confident in what they can bring to the table. So as far as I'm concerned, it's wide open. Yeah, and... The fact that this is just one game makes a huge difference as well. One game, anything can happen. These players are certainly skilled enough for that. Yeah. So I think, well, now's a good, a good, as good a time as any to bring up the fact that um, we're playing a very unusual game here in the sense that uh, two players are going to advance. As far as the tournament is concerned, coming first and coming second, qualitatively identical. So yes. that obviously is going to create a very specific kind of metagame for this match in particular. So what kind of alternative tactics or differences in how players would normally approach a game do you expect to see? 
I think when we were talking about this last night, we uh, I think you said something really great in that in the opening, they're probably not going to interfere with each other more than usual. I would expect just a very normal first couple rounds of this game. But as a favorite or two might start to be determined, or if there's one specific runaway favorite, you might see the game being increasingly thrown to them in order to kick someone else. And I think in Terra Mystica, fighting for a second place is a skill in itself, but a hard one to practice and learn. Some players like Zorus might have had experience doing this in asynchronous games well. I would, I would guess that the other three players have a lot less experience trying to do that. Um, and we will see, I think, a fiercer mid game and a really, really tough end game to make sure uh, that you know each player is looking out for at least second place. Right. Yeah. That point about what you were saying about Zorus there is actually really. Uh, that's a really smart point because on Snellman, of course, there's no auction. So Zorus has played countless numbers of games where sort of even from faction selection, he would have been aware that his chances of coming out strictly on top were very slim and that it's a matter of maximizing your relative position given that you don't think that you can win. So he surely does have a lot of experience pivoting from trying to come first to trying to get the best position possible, whereas that hasn't ever been the case for any of these other players. So right. I think, yeah, you're right that he probably does have a good bit of an edge there in that sense. Um, okay. It looks like the game's up, and it looks like uh, faction selection is already underway. So yeah. let's start doing some analysis. Let's see what bonus tiles we've got, what round scoring we've got, and what first pick we already have. Yeah, so uh, first pick alchemists, we'll briefly touch upon that as we go through these bonus tiles. Bonus tiles, we are missing the dwelling scoring tile, we are missing the spade tile, and we are missing the worker plus power tile. Uh, I think alchemists are a fine choice. They really like this big building tile. They really like the ship tile. Having no spade gives them a later game advantage because they will want to produce their own digs later in the game. It is relatively high coins in bonus tiles, or a bit above average at least, so that favors alchemists a little less. Um, as we move on to the scoring rounds, we start with spades. We will then have temples, trading posts, dwellings, dwellings again, and then big buildings. And in terms of a scoring track, I think alchemists do not profit much here. Um, this does seem like if I'm playing alchemists in this game, I might consider a stronghold opening from seat one, which might give me an edge on getting the double dig action. Uh, still try to get a temple in round two, even if I don't end up with earth one, that might be a playable line. Though alchemists want to get all their dwellings out well before rounds four and five, so it's it's not obvious to me that they'll do well in this track. Yeah, I think that you highlighted exactly what the, the struggles that Alchemists will face in this game is. And so I I myself, this, as a sort of, you know, like novice Alchemist player, this is the sort of track that would have scared me off from picking them instantly because I just don't know where my points are going to come from in the in the mid and late game. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the the passing bonuses go, I it's it's a little bit difficult about how to evaluate the dwelling bonus tile as the as ones that alchemist wants to see um zoras has an ultimate guide on alchemist where he talks about this process about evaluating each of the bonus tiles for for my money i usually think that the big bonus the big building bonus tile is the absolute most important one um and then probably i put the dwelling one second although you could make a consideration for the the passing ship scoring mm -hmm. So missing the dwelling bonus is certainly not the best. If you want, if one of them was not going to be present, you'd probably want it to be the trading posts. Certainly among the scoring ones. I think among all past tiles, my least favorite to see as alchemist would be the six coins and the cult plus four coins. Um, in the end, you do want to be evaluating those tiles as just converting them into points before deciding to take them or not. And usually it's the the big buildings, which is eight points, two workers, and the shipping, nine points, three power. Uh, six coins is six points. That's OK if you're going to be converting early. Um, but I, in my experience, I would actually say that even the ship pass VP tile is more important than the big building tile, because alchemists really specialize on that tile when most factions don't. Um, we do have dwarves in seat two. Yeah, and I uh, I think that this is a, a 
it's funny because you see both of the shipping tiles present in the bonuses. And for a lot of players, I think that that scares them away from the factions that don't use shipping whatsoever. But Certainly. I think that this is actually a fairly encouraging track for dwarves. Um, I think that they are one of those factions that can place a lot of dwellings in round four and round five because they're going to be jumping a lot. And that's a very work intensive process. And they have an internal way to score um, that helps them along. I don't like that the spade isn't present. It's going to be very important for dwarves to get a lot of spades in this game. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so what are your thoughts about this dwarf, dwarf spec? I think I'm a bit colder on them than you might be. I do agree that the end game scoring and the track in general seems fine for a dwarves game just because most factions aren't going to score much. Um, and on the other hand, if I'm dwarves, I want to get my workers situation really figured out by the end of round two or round three and just like alchemists you want to have that worker production early and having the dwellings in round four and five kind of say you know maybe don't do that um and then in the past tiles you'd you'd ideally have four workers on the past tiles instead of three uh you'd like there to be a big building uh early round so that you can get a worker's cult bonus and that's not there so those would be a few reasons i would be discounting dwarves a bit more than usual here Right. And now we see, interestingly, again, we see nomads picked in the third seat. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I think we might have been a tiny bit behind, but mermaids. Right mermaids now. already, yeah, picked in the fourth seat. Now we have two picks back to back to, to talk about. Um, so the way I usually feel about nomads is they're, they're the quintessential economic faction. Um, so what they have going for them in this game is that the spade isn't present, but their stronghold gives them a way to terraform without using spades. So that might be very valuable for them. But then, of course, because they don't have any inherent form of scoring, uh, they rely a lot on the passing tiles and the round scoring in order to generate points. And when you see something like pretty early trading post scoring and then back-to-back -back dwellings, you are worried about what your point ceiling is going to be. So the Nomads pick, I think, might be a little difficult to generate points with. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not disagreeing. Temples in round two uh, do make a statement like, do you really want to rush for Earth 1? Because you're probably not going to get the four points there. Um, very interesting to me is Claybo opening the bidding by going immediately down to 25 on Nomads. Yeah. And that, I'm, right. I'm not convinced, though I could just be missing a lot of stuff here. Um, I, I am not certain which faction I like most here. It might be dwarves or mermaids. We haven't talked about mermaids yet, but they can be played economically. They can be played a bit more towards the bonus tiles. Um, they are kind of like nomads in a different way. While, while you point out that nomad stronghold gives them a way to avoid using spades, mermaids can just race around all the blues on the map uh, as a way to get early spots. So they right. can be played economically. They often are. But the scoring, the scoring track just doesn't necessarily encourage that. Yeah. So for mermaids, I think one really reasonable opportunity here would be that you open with the um, the temp shipping bonus tile, and you go for the double spade in round one, and then you do like a dwelling rush. You mm -hmm. do a temple in round two. You do a few trade, like probably for water one. You do a few trading posts in round three, and then you re up on your worker economy with the double dwelling scorings in round four and five um yeah, that seems like a good plan for mermaids but the inclusion of alchemists is always going to be difficult for mermaids to navigate yeah if we could get those hexes up really uh, hex names up really quickly from production um with mermaids in a dwelling rush we really like to see or we typically see them dig the black hex c1 as one of their first uh things to do with temporary shipping in a dwelling rush being on c1 either starting from d2 or e4 really allows them to get a lot of hexes with two shipping for cheap um you typically see a mermaid's dwelling rush start on e4 and d5 use the double dig on c1 and then c4 and then have access to eight total blues um, and that seems like a fine line to, to play here. Uh, I might go for a half rush, and when I say that, I mean one trading post, five dwellings, something along those lines, for easy access to a temple in the next round. 
Yeah, so I think well, I think that that has to be on the table for mermaids, and that will inform um, that. That I just I'm sort of struggling to see a little bit what a better opening line would be for mermaids than something in that vicinity, especially with temples in round two. They're not very much encouraged to open temple in round one and just go for something like temple and three dwellings like they right. otherwise might. Um, as far as the bidding is concerned, though, we see that uh, dwarves are actually generating the majority of the of the attention right now so what we might make of that is that you know we have the typical mend well not mend but we have that black gray yellow blue color wheel setup that is so common in base map terra mystica games mm -hmm. and um dwarves in a, well the gray faction in a lot of situations has access to a ton of leech and having access to a lot of leech and therefore to a lot of power actions early just helps your game be good sort of yeah. regardless of what else is going on so maybe dwarves are getting a lot of that attention for that reason but we also see nomads are already at 23 as well so i'm really wondering what the justification for this nomads bidding is right now i, I mean to be honest i'm not super sure um one big factor is that nomads starting on d3 are guaranteed to have a neighbor with alchemists on c1 and or mermaids on d2 uh pretty early so I think that the access to Leech guaranteed there, they probably have an easy time getting through the center from F3 to uh, to E6 and probably their choice of D4 or G2, but maybe the dwarves will be aggressive and lock those up relatively early. Though with no spade pass tile, these like the way the spades break in the first two rounds can really change how this game looks. Right. And so, well, so one thing that I'm sort of considering right now is that the players in the game are seeing mermaids in the fourth seat. So they they must be thinking temp shipping for mermaids is the obvious bonus tile pick. And then mm -hmm. and then nomads get to pick right after. So maybe the nomads are like what do you think about a nomad stronghold opening here with the taking the the big big big, big building pass tile in uh, it round seems 1. seems fine. Um I do agree that mermaids are highly unlikely to take it in seat 4. Um even if they don't take temp ship what do they take instead priest so it would it would almost certainly be the temp ship tile for mermaids um let's see i i don't see how nomads are five points better than mermaids necessarily nor how dwarves are 10 points better there could be some kind of psychology with the difference between dwarves and engineers in this color wheel black starting on c1 was an innovation made a few years ago so that Darklings would win this matchup more in the asynchronous Snellman games uh, compared to engineers who had otherwise been dominant. The fact that dwarves aren't engineers isn't necessarily a big deal. If a gray faction gets a lot of leech, they're going to be in great shape. We'll see if that affects the player's decisions to try to actively deny the gray faction more leech at here or not. If Leech is denied to them, I think that bidding down to 19 while Alchemist and Mermaid still are on 30 would probably be a mistake. Right. So here's a consideration that, that just dawned on me. I'm wondering how much this is playing into the faction analysis by the players right now. Alchemists, notoriously very hungry for priests. Nomads, we're now speculating, might open Stronghold. Mermaids, we're speculating, might open with a dwelling war dwelling rush and so both yeah. of those factions are going to potentially delay their temple building mm -hmm. until round two dwarves interestingly enough of these four factions are the most oriented towards playing on the cult track i think you have a good point there i mean i've seen a few games where mermaids do a fine job of it um the fact that alchemists special landscape saves them a couple priests could definitely push them a little more towards cults we sh we saw sprockets play a fantastic alchemist game in his group uh utilizing that advantage um and i do think dwarves do have the most culty like abilities here but i actually have personal experience playing dwarves with round two temples round one digs where i just built my temple in round two um so i'm i'm not convinced at all we'll see a temple in round one um i would even suggest that alchemists have a fair chance at being stronghold round one temple round two with earth one uh, but that's just a very preliminary guess on how this will run
Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess I'm operating under the assumption that with respect to the bonus tiles, I think that dwarves taking the priest and sticking the priest in in the earth cult in round one is very uh, seems pretty reasonable for them. Absolutely. Um, one one reason they might have for taking a temple in round one, I was spe I'm speculating, might be so that they can lock up the three spot on the air cult and get a um and get a spade off of the air cult in round three just because this game is so tight on spades and dwarves really are the faction that um are going to struggle the most with spades i mean it's not like nomads when they build their stronghold don't use any spade power actions just because they have their stronghold out and same thing with which with uh, mermaids going on a dwelling rush they're still going to be wanting spade power actions so gray might i mean yeah, I don't know. Well, just thinking through it, the upside of dwarves being a cult-oriented faction compared to everything else here doesn't seem like it does enough for them. I think that they might be in a slightly worse spot than I was previously considering. Fair enough. Um, one last point I want to make is that mermaids are quite guaranteed to have the double dig action here, which means they basically come with four extra points if you don't want, or if you just want to already evaluate that uh that track scoring in round one they have that that spade two times two pretty much guaranteed to them if they take temp ship as we expect um they're the only faction that starts with more than seven power in bowl two among these four and they're going to take a power tile on top of that yeah so, so... I think Gino bidding on them here at 30 is a good call yeah i think if gino gets mermaids for 30 um, like if somebody jumps on Alchemist now, I don't think that anybody will, but I think if somebody jumps on Alchemist now, then Gino will have very clearly uh, stolen the draft, the, the option yeah, in a sense. sense. Um, but the question is, when when are Alchemists going to get bid on relative to these other factions? Um, because we still see that Dwarves and Nomads have gotten most of the bids. Yeah, um, and I think I overvalue alchemists in these kind of situations because they really do like to to pounce on whatever scoring opportunities the track can provide, and alchemists here might not get more than twenty points off the track. Um, a typical good track scoring game for any cult is usually around thirty points. If you can get between twenty five and thirty points, that's generally a good place to aim for. A strong witches game in with round six towns, for example, might be into the 45 range of track scoring, and that's about as high as it gets. Um, poor games for track scoring are in the high teens, um, and I think this is a high teens, low 20s scoring game for alchemists on the track, which does mean, you know, they probably shouldn't get bid for a little while. Uh, we see no one bumping Gino yet off mermaids. Yeah, and I think that that's so surprising because in this very particular setup where the top two players are both going to advance, I think mermaids are an incredibly safe faction right now. I Yeah, I think they're the most inclined to get track points in this game by quite a good margin. Uh, just that half dwelling rush or a full dwelling rush followed by a round two temple, followed by three trading posts or four trading posts in round three, if you can get some extra coins in there. Um, and then followed up with some dwellings in round four and five, maybe have ideally have the ship pass tile for round six, build your stronghold then for an extra five points, get your free shipping bump. I mean, the track seems to line up well with mermaids, and I would suggest that mermaids definitely have the easiest time to pull 30 points off this track. And and so it's really funny because that that would suggest that mermaids are probably in sort of like the best position, and yet we see them... Still, Gino has not been outbid for them, but yeah. but nomads and, and dwarves still commanding a certain amount of attention. So as we mentioned in the preferred factions analysis, Zorus is a very strong nomads player and um, is quite adept with them. He's pulled off some really amazing sort of innovative strategies playing nomads. Um, he must have some idea about how nomads are going to approach this game, that yeah. he thinks that they're in a much better spot than I think a casual observer might realize. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I would not suggest that I would personally be able to come up with any strategies we might see from Zoras or any of these Nomads players. I don't consider myself a particularly good Nomads player. Um, I, I think maybe the main thing scaring people away from picking mermaids here is that if you have the temporary shipping card and alchemists do start in the northwest there on C1, what is your game plan? And I think the game plan is still fine. I, I don't think it's a huge deal. Um, alchemists actually have this problem, if we could quickly get those hex names again, um, where if they start on C1, mermaids can easily just take E5 from them. And alchemists really, really almost need that path of C1 to E5 to B3 to A8 uh, via two shipping to put a lot of dwellings down early. Um, so while mermaids might be scared of alchemists hitting C1 early, uh, they can just fight back with E5 and make it tough on alchemists and need to ship and dig on B2 or something like that to get over. Right. And so so maybe what we're seeing now in the bids, maybe there's a the explanation for what's going on is that nomads and dwarves are n don't have to worry about what the other factions are, are going to be doing. Right. Relative to their game plans. But but the mermaids and alchemist player will be that some some odd dwelling placement right off the bat or an unconventional opening could tank your expectation as black or blue and sort of make the game feel already beyond reach right off the bat. So that's something like nomads and dwarves are just going to feel much safer because they're sort of uninterruptible in comparison. Yep, I, I think that's that's a good way to put it. So current bidding situation, Zorus has the Doris for 16, Playbo has the nomads for 19, Gino has the mermaids for 30. It is uh, Rickery's bid. And back to dwarves at fifteen. Right. Um, I would think that mermaids get bid down by about five before alchemists get taken. Five or more, maybe like four to nine points difference between mermaids and alchemists. So it looks like dwarves and nomads have a ways to go too. Yeah, I. But you know, so it's 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 interesting because if you if you're thinking in terms of safety, caution executing a game plan without worrying too much about what the other players are doing, at some point you have to realize that you can't give up all of your starting victory points. Like part of the caution is that you're not going to start at zero, right? Yes. Like if, if dwarves and nomads get too low, they, they no longer end up being safe picks because they start so far behind the other factions. And so that's what's making me especially puzzled that at least mermaids haven't been thought of as as worth a pick because I really do believe that uh, some kind of dwelling rush or half dwelling rush type opening is possible for mermaids regardless of what alchemists decide to do. Yeah. Um, and going back to that, there's going to be two advancing players from this game. Do you really want to throw 15 points to a faction like dwarves where your connection is so susceptible? Like if dwarves miss out on something like G3, because mermaids dig it early, or if you miss out on, uh, I guess they're probably not missing much in the north. They can probably connect through the north pretty safely. I feel like there's still a few ways where this goes horrifically wrong for dwarves, and they just don't even have a chance at second place. So I think this doesn't make much sense. Uh, Clavo has been bidding down the mermaids with Gino now. Gino keeps defending them. I think we agree, rightly so. Yeah, I, I think that this is about... This is still in the in the vicinity of where I think mermaids should still be picked a little bit more strongly. Um, I wonder how Zorus is feeling about nomads at 19. Surely he's going to be confident, but I'm wondering if Zorus is thinking this is a second place pick. Like I'm just going to play a, a, a rock solid nomads game like I've done a thousand times before. I'm going to rely mm -hmm. on the fact that blue is in the game. I'm guaranteed to get a certain amount of leech, especially if Alchemist starts C1. And I'm just going to ride that out to a, a decent productive game. And that's going to be enough. Yeah, I, I think that's a pretty justifiable thing to do if you're Zorus. Um, as the author of the Alchemist's Ultimate Guide, he surely knows how, how difficult their situation is here with mermaids in the game and a bad track. Um, so it's not too surprising to not see 
him on that. Another benefit to having nomads and trying to get second place is your sandstorm, is that stronghold capability to just destroy any hex you would like to and change it to yellow, because you can clearly identify who might be fighting you for second place or put yourself farther into first place so that um, so that people want to throw you points in order to kick other people. Um, I think just having that sandstorm does have value in this kind of setup. Right. And, and interestingly, um, in games where alchemists are sort of running away with things, they all, they're going to have three shipping very early. They're going to have fully upgraded digging efficiency very early. They can kind of play that role too. But the problem is the way that the track is oriented in this game, alchemists are just not going to have the wiggle room to be spending workers hate digging other people's hexes because they're going to be so fixated on their own scoring. I agree. Yeah. There's a, there's a fun comment in chat about, uh, oh my God, they're still auctioning. I've watched a full episode of TV and thought you missed so much. You did miss so much. You've missed all the people undervaluing mermaids. Oh, it looks like, oh, the game has begun. We do have Rickery bouncing off of dwarves and going to alchemists at 30, immediately placing sure. on E5. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I think yeah, Gino's I'm still... The, the, the deal, I think the... so too. Um, Claybo ended up with the dwarves at 14 starting points. Zorus with his nomads that he put into the game at 18 victory points, and mermaids are at 24, which is definitely not 30, but you know, it was kind of like 28 if you ignore the round one scoring. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that's that's the point that you were making before. You just sort of given given the the basic certainty of mermaids getting the double spade in round one, if that's what they want, they start four points ahead of where they're currently represented. And at best, one other faction is going to dig one hex uh, in, in this first round. Um, so one thing that just occurred to me, and I don't know why it took this long for it to, to occur to me, is that alchemists can start E5C1, just ignore the East. Everyone else is ignoring the East. Like, if you start in the east, are you going to have any... You're going to have dwarves as neighbors, I suppose. Um, but you could start C1E5, try to lock up that territory, then you've solved one big problem of yours with just the issue of how to get east eventually. Right, yeah. that That's a that's a very good point. Uh, we see actually it's B5. Whoa. That I... is new to me. I think that this, so we already talked about Zorus feeling very safe on nomads and that being comfortable with where he, he had taken them. And we already talked about how we thought Gino was slightly ahead coming out of this auction. Now that dwellings have been placed, I am like, this is now to me a, an overwhelmingly safe position for Gino and Zorus. I have to agree. To in a really good spot here. I have to agree. Um, if you're Claybo, you really need to figure out how to build a massive worker economy to make up some points that you otherwise might be missing. Um, workers and cults would have to be a huge focus from the very beginning for dwarves to have a chance here. And I mean, honestly, especially if nomads put this last dwelling on B4, I think alchemists might just be out of it. Yeah, and so it's very interesting that Rickery decided to open B5 knowing that nomads have this extra dwelling to place. Zorus ends up going E8, and so this is like a pure leech play from Zorus. He's going to yep. get a tremendous amount of leech in round one. Yep. So we're excited to see the expected openings for each faction. Uh, mermaids do get the potential for a full dwelling rush if they'd like. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll just need a bunch of coins in round two and three to support that, and they'll be off and running. Yeah. Um, we... In terms of we should briefly talk about who we expect to win network, who we expect to win cults this game. Um, alchemists and nomads typically do really well on network. Uh, mermaids on a dwelling rush would have to be in that race pretty tightly, at least for second, if unless alchemists have a really underwhelming game, which might happen. Um, and it's going to be a brutal fight for a network the whole way through, potentially. 
Yeah, I, I would say in a spades rich game or like an extreme worker rich game where dwarves can upgrade digging or something that they can also be fighting for network, but certainly not in this opening position. Yeah, yeah. Dwarves being isolated out east is just kind of, is pretty unfortunate for them, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so we see Zorus has actually gone for the priest, the priest tiles. So this might, so he might still be going for a stronghold opening here, and he's taking the priest to get a secure. This first priest to earth is worth like a lot of coins, and it's worth, um, just like good cult position. So I think that that might be what he's thinking. That yeah. he'll find a way to build a stronghold anyway. And very interestingly, Rickery takes the six coins instead of the worker. Um, it's it's hard to gauge the value of a worker in round one, but in a contested map, it might be more than six points to me. Um, of course, Rickery could just be expecting to not get a dig. Rickery opens the game by upgrading in the center. Dwarves do as well. Nomads uh, upgrade where they expect mermaids to be going for the dwelling rush. And this all makes sense, I think. Yeah, yeah. I I just think that uh I think that there's that this is now becoming a, a quite unassailable position for even nomads. Like I think Zorus is such a capable nomads player that with the amount of leech that he's gonna be generating in these first couple of rounds, you have to give him a good shot to, to win the whole game. Yeah, certainly. Uh that priest, as chat points out, is uh, is an interesting one. Uh, the obvious thing to do, as you mentioned very early on, is to send it to send it to Earth. It would be worth three coins this round, two coins next round. It gets you a power or two along the way. Um, it does mean that we just might see um, a temple opening from nomads. And I think what you say about having having a good feel for the map control as nomads gives you even more reason to just take earth one just guarantee your own points so okay so here's the double dig as we expected and it does the first one does go c1 again as anticipated should be c4 in most situations but it's c3 it's c3 so maybe the presence of alchemists on uh b5 is scaring mermaids away from fully committing to the dwelling rush i mean they're still going to get a lot of dwellings down this way so to me that says that gino's preparing for the half rush instead of the full rush uh, he only needs to place one more dwelling that's two shipping away this way and that's the one in the very southwest there um and otherwise he'll take one of the adjacent or one ship dwellings and build a trading house and that's what i would expect given not digging C4 and going C3 instead. Um, mermaids have their special landscape, which allows them so much flexibility in forming another town or just even connecting, that um, even if their starting dwellings are awkward, such as uh, D5, C4, uh, as we might have suggested, their double dig might have gone, um, their landscape will save them from that awkwardness. Right, yeah. I mean, you don't often see it because you want the landscape to be used for a town, but there's nothing preventing the mermaids from just putting the landscape down in some random river hex halfway between two of their dwellings to allow them right. to connect. Right. So we do see here that, uh, so dwarves take um, Earth 1, uh, which gives them the singular power that they need to take the single spade action. Of course, nomads are also in a position to take it. Um, but we've hypothesized that perhaps nomads aren't as interested in the spade power action in round one. So we'll see if dwarves do get away with a spade power action in round one. We saw in the first fire to open, uh, Christopher Ho played dwarves in a very similar situation where he basically had access to no leech for several rounds of the game and still managed to get second place. But um, yeah, this is not the sort of opening that uh, that you're looking for with dwarves, I think. No, certainly not. And uh, for alchemists too, it's it's almost uh, crazy to think that they did take a power action for a priest, but they're just going to try to get these black hexes in round two instead of round one. Um, 
I guess they didn't really have great alternatives. I probably would have gone for a stronghold uh, just to get those hexes secured, but right, this yeah. securing Earth 1, we see that mermaids are the ones left out of Earth 1, and our expected plan for mermaids, either on a full dwelling rush or a half rush, is that they just don't need it. Right, yeah. I, I think that this is a this is still a super encouraging spot for um for mermaids to be in. I'm interested to so everybody has ignored well, we don't know that they've definitely ignored the second temple in uh round two, but you would have to think that especially alchemists and dwarves would probably be making a mistake if they stretch themselves thin for a second temple in round two at this point. I think um, that's probably accurate. Yeah. Uh, the second temple, for those of you who might not be following what we're saying, the second temple requires you to upgrade to a trading post and build that temple if you already have a temple down. And that costs four workers eight coins. Early in the game, that's such a high premium to be paying. You'd better be getting a great use for that extra priest income. You'd better be having a great use for that favor tile. Um, it's going to be very hard to make up for the resource resource value of those four workers, eight coins. Um, they're just often better spent making dwellings. Um, and your coins could be used to advance ship or something to that extent. Um, there's just so many good things to do with those resources that building a temple doesn't allow you to do. Uh, one of the things that is quite nice about the spot that Zorus is in is that like people are going to be passing ahead of him because they just don't have things that they can really be doing mm -hmm. with the with the rest of the round but he's in a very enviable position he can easily take the double spade next round if that's what he wants to do he basically has his pick of power actions whatever he thinks he needs he can go for it um right. he's getting 5 coins at the end of this round from the from the cult, cult bonus, bonus. Uh, dwarves we see doing a very early tunnel. To this C2. is pretty reasonable given they, they had the build, big building tile. Um, when I get that as dwarves unexpectedly, I kind of treat it as a range extension sometimes. I do just do what Claybo just did and build an extra dwelling with those two extra workers. Getting, getting round one dwelling income, or not necessarily round one, but just early as dwarves is just a huge problem to solve. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a, a really reasonable uh, move as well. But the the dwarves' spade pressure is going to continue for some time. It's going to be very difficult for dwarves to get access to spades. I think. I agree. Um, and Zorus does pass second. Uh, Rickery passed uh, very early for the ship VP, uh, and that's not because he's trying to get that pass tile aggressively necessarily. I don't think there was that much competition for it. It's just that he was out of moves. Yeah. Yeah, then... this is not the alchemist opening that you want. It it makes me really question this B5 opening. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that alchemists are never not going east. There's too much of a density of very easily uh, terraformed hexes for, yep. for black on the eastern continent. So they're going to have to get there eventually. Um, so... One concern is like, well, one question is, well, just why not why not start there? What is the benefit of B5? If the issue is the tenuousness of your connection, in this particular matchup, at this particular time, it's still possible to connect via the south. It, your connection isn't necessarily dead in the water, but I just feel like alchemists have sort of beached themselves in a way where yeah. the and fantasy I mean, you, opening you of... B5. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not Even if you take B5, there, there's that yellow right next to you on B4, and nomads can just jump in there when you least expect it. Right, yeah. So I just, I don't think that that was a, a particularly well-justified placement. I think that it has also made, I think Claybo probably had an expectation that alchemists would not do something like this. And so maybe the bidding sure. for dwarves was partially informed by Dwarves having a likely neighbor in the east that they've ended up not having. I think that's a good point. Um, so th that's also made things considerably more difficult for dwarves. We see that uh, Zorus has gone for the cult coins. Cult, cult coins, which is uh, he's going to have an enormous amount of coins already this early in the game, which is quite nice for him. Uh, no in, in general. 
Yeah. Yeah, for nomads in general, but I think especially in this particular game because round three trading posts is not where you want to see trading post scoring. Trading posts are just too resource intensive to get on the board that early for any kind yeah. of real economic benefit. But now that you're, if you're Zorus here and you're swimming in coins, and you can get quite a few dwellings down in this round with Earth One if you take the double spade or something. Um, I think Zorus could probably justify building a couple of trading posts in in round uh, three and buffing up his um, his round bonuses. He also gets a priest to air first. Oh, Zorus is in such a good spot here. This is yeah. very early cult considerations from Zorus are going to pay off, I think, massively. Yeah, this this looks fantastic. Uh, Rickery advancing ship. Uh, chat pointed out to me uh, that my comment he was out of moves was indeed incorrect. He absolutely could have advanced ship last round. I think I might have done that if I was Alchemist, but I don't think it'll be a big difference in how this game plays out. Um, Zorus had, what was that, 0, 7, 5 in his power bowls. So yeah, he wasn't able to take seven coins and then double dig. So he's still just going to guarantee that double dig, which is not going to be contested. Uh, Gino has, if I'm Gino, I'm taking seven coins first action here, and I'm going to love it. Yeah, I mean, I think the part and parcel of the dwelling rush opening has to be that you you bolster your coin economy somehow, because your your coins can't keep up with your the amount of workers that you're producing very easily. So, I think the uh, the coin. I mean, if he doesn't, if Gino doesn't snap off the coins per action here, I'd be very surprised. Well, maybe he doesn't have to because of the way the power is distributed. He could probably commit a priest because uh, he is on the priest bonus. He maybe commits a priest to water or something prior to. Wow. I, I think I would take the seven coins here, but it uh, priest to water does make a fair bit of sense. Also, though dwarves didn't do it, which means they just might not prioritize it very much here. As you suggest, um, an error spade bonus would be huge for them. Uh, we do see dwarves build that trading post instead, meaning they're going to go for a second temple, I'm pretty certain. Yeah, uh, it looks like it. And they might be thinking, let me take air two and send a priest to air this round. I don't think that's impossible. It, it's hard to read what the dwarves' best favor tile is. I think if yeah. you're taking a temple here, you absolutely have to take Earth 2 to make up that worker income. Right, uh, and that's a very frequent favor tile for dwarves to take. But you are right that the the air 2... I mean, the, like like we said, this is this is just a massively spade-tight game for, uh, for, for dwarves. So I... I would be really interested to see what favorite tile they do go for, but it does look like they're barreling directly towards a, a second temple for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things about Zorus's position here that I'm such a big fan of is just the the casual way that he's getting exactly what he wants. He didn't need the, the coins action this round. He got a big boost of coins last round. He awesome. is on the, the cult bump tile. Um and because everybody else's power situation was so dire, there was no risk to him losing the double spade. Like sometimes yeah. when you pass early for the double spade, it, it's a purely temple play. You have to take it first because somebody else can also take it. But he, right. could, he could commit this first priest to air, get himself another spade in round three, and just completely dominate the, um, the, the, the cult cult. track while also getting the best of the, the bonuses that are available. Yep, and we see him lock up these two center hexes. I think that's quite a good move. This southern or this center red would be a big target for dwarves, so they can hop over to the southwest. The center obviously could be contested by alchemists if they wanted to barge through um, for whatever reason. Um, so these two hexes now locked up for Zorus is a huge win for him. Um, Zorus, I mean, there's a chance he could be going for a second temple here, you know, build that remaining yellow, uh, take a worker's power action, or just raw convert three power to a worker. Um, either of those could work. And just build another temple. He has the coins. Yeah, and that's a sort of very enviable position that he's put himself in where something like just converting power for a single worker or taking the worker power action after taking the double spade all seems like a very reasonable way that his round might go. Mm -hmm. um, I think Gino is not far behind. I think that I'm, I'm, I'm very wowed by 
the efficiency with which Zoros has executed these first two rounds. Um, but I think Gino's still in a quite good spot himself. Oh, for sure. We haven't seen Gino do pretty much anything this round. We saw him take the seven coins action, which is, you know, a huge boost to any time, any faction who takes it. Um, with very few exceptions, we see Gino take water one on a temple here. Totally reasonable. Probably sends a priest to water for two. Dwarves do beat him to that thir uh, that three spot. Alchemists do not have their blacks threatened in the north, and they will get those two crucial hexes before mermaids might dig them away. I, I think but it's very easy for yellow and blue so far, and tough yeah. sledding for the other two. That's right, yeah. Okay, so we still haven't seen what Claybo's temple plans are, though we assume still that they are temple plans. Um, Claybo does not have enough power to do single dig and a dwelling, though he could put single dig landscape down uh, as a tunnel action. That yeah, that is a good point, and the um. The dwarf landscape on that central green hex uh, is it's a quite reasonable position for dwarves to place um, their landscape, given that they don't have access to um, that southern that central southern red anymore, yeah. because it'll allow them to to tunnel over to the western side of the map. Yeah, can we get those hex names really quickly so we can better refer to these? I think we're referring to uh, landscape on H three, perhaps. No, uh, G3. Oh, F. I was referring to G3, but F4 makes some sense as well. Yeah, I was saying, well, yeah, I was saying F4 so that you can get to G1 with the, from the landscape. Yeah, I was thinking G3, then you hop to I6, you dig I5 and get that gray G1, I3 that way. Your way right, makes some yeah. sense as well. And it doesn't spend uh, workers to tunnel, which is a plus. All right, thank you, production. Appreciate that. Uh, we see Claybo actually... Oh, interesting. So Claybo decides to take an, a priest power action this round, which I you know, wasn't I was certain that he was going to do. I was wondering if anyone would do that. Um, and I thought Zorus had a really aggressive line where he takes that action and tries to get the priest to fire, but mermaids take that. Yeah, so, well, one of the things that I'm skeptical of dwarves doing it is... Like dwarves were in a position to take the double spade in round three with their power situation, but now right. they probably aren't. Uh, right. So I just you know unless unless they find a way to to pull up with the double spade in round three, I don't think that using power for uh, a priest here was will get them enough. It's mm -hmm. two coins. It is some called position. They will cycle a little bit of power. Um, but I'm not. I'm not convinced. Maybe this is the. Maybe maybe the play is priest to air, temple for air two. Maybe that is the consideration. I mean, that'd be spicy. Um, having that extra power income is probably a better advantage than usual in one of these spade tight games. Uh, yeah, and with and with the lack of neighbors that they have in the in the east for the foreseeable future, you could see it being an unorthodox but possible line for dwarves. It's just the kind of thing that it's so outside the norm of how Gray right. usually approaches uh, their favor tiles that it just it's insanely difficult to evaluate. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Zorus did build a trading post here, so I think he is going for that second temple. Two temple nomads. What a thing. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I think Zorus has correctly identified that um, there are no dedicated cult factions in the game that even though dwarves can devote a lot of their priests to cults, that doesn't mean that they have a sort of inherent cult progression the way that cultists and Orin and chaos magicians tend to, um, mm -hmm. even swarmlings. So I think Zorus has identified that he can claim a lot of ground on cults by playing this way and that the two temples helps um, because he will end up upgrading his shipping all the way, probably with the shipping past tile in the game. Uh, so I think it's a pretty reasonable way to go. I think the other the other push and pull is that scoring is so tight this game with 
the way that rounds four and five are both dwellings. Um, mm -hmm. That I think Zora, I think, well, if I'm Zorus, I'm just going Earth one, Water one. I don't know what other favorite tiles Zorus would be thinking of. What you do you could go for the air two in a similar vein to how the power would help get extra spades, um, but and like an extra cult spade as well. I think might be possible from an air two pick. Uh, but I, I think Water One is a fantastic play as well. Just to nail down those points, uh, point certainty. Um, a very early estimate of who's winning this game. I think we might have some ideas already on who's likely to win this game. Um, we made our pregame estimations. Uh, Dwarves and Alchemists have not quite followed through with what we thought would be ideal starts for them, and Mermaids and, Al uh, and Nomads have. Um, maybe Nomads have even exceeded expectations. Would you agree with that? I, I think so, yeah. I, I now think that Nomads and uh, Mermaids are in sort of equivalently strong positions. Um, oh, interestingly, Gino's, Gino's already passed for the trading post scoring, which makes a lot of sense, but he could have placed another dwelling this round. So I'm wondering if he just did very specific math to see what he would need to do next so, round. I think one thing that happened is that Claybo for the second temple did take Earth 2 instead of Air 2. Um, so Gino's playing it super safe to make sure he gets uh, first seat on next round with that pass tile. Um, or maybe he noticed that Rickery is out of great things to do as well. That's also a possibility. Right, yeah. Um, one of the things for Alchemists that I'm very worried about now is that uh, when it when are Alchemists going to pick up Water 1? I, I don't see how Alchemists' game really survives without having Water 1 this game. No. And... Um, I mean, to be completely honest, points aside, Alchemists are a full round behind economically. It's basically, if you're Alchemists a fine opening, like a average or above average opening, is Temple in Three Dwellings to get your favorite tile, to get your opening worker income done. That's where Rickery is right now at the end of round two, and all he has extra is two workers and a few points. Right, the points don't yeah. do you anything right now. You want to be building a massive worker economy as Alchemist, and Rickery is just a round behind, which is pretty hard to beat. Are pretty hard to escape from, I should say. Yeah, and and so I think we should be on the lookout uh, for things that alchemists might do to pull the game back. But this is definitely a, a quite, I think, dire situation for them to be in. As you mentioned, that normally their economy is supposed to have exploded by this stage of the game. Sometimes you see as many as seven or eight dwellings already built. For example, on the board. seven dwellings is not too rare for alchemists to have down at the end of round two. And this is clearly not that level of worker income. So Zorus is in the tank here a little bit. Uh, it seemed like he was definitely going for the second temple. I think he pretty much still is, but now he's debating which so I think he's going to be taking. Worth considering is how many coins he's going to have available to him next round if he does build a temple here. Because next round, he is really trying to hammer down those trading posts, right? And if we are making good enough projections, Zorus will want to build a temple here and, like, three trading posts next round. Um, and that would cost 14 coins total. He already did have 12, so it's probably not that bad. Yeah, and as we see, he does go for Water 1, so he's definitely intending to build uh, quite a few trading posts next round. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this is such a solid play from from Zorus. My expectation is that Claybo might feel like he needs to leverage an early town, like with a bridge and another dig or something uh, in the center, so his economy can kind of catch up. Sure. Um, so if you're getting an early town, typically the play is to take the two keys town just because it provides so many endgame cult advantages and provides so much good cult income. Though the cult income, I mean, that's not really as enticing as it typically is this game. Right. Yeah. It's it's quite a... You see, it's a kind of a rainbow 
of colors, which is always a bad shout because you can normally just focus on one and double up on income on bonuses, and that's much better. Um, and yeah, it's a, there's nothing even very enticing. Like I said, I think the spade in the next round is the the most crucial cult bonus because spades are so tight this game. Yep. Right right now, Zorus is the only person who is getting anything out of that. Just further pushing nomads ahead as a faction in a very safe position. I think mermaids are also doing quite well. Um, oh, interestingly, um, mermaids are going to build quite a few trading posts next round. That's going to give nomads a lot of leech as well. Yes, yes. Certainly that western temple for nomads is going to be the best building on the map for the next round. <laughs> A bunch of two-for-ones coming in there. Um, so to end the round, Zorus did not uh, get an extra worker to build another dwelling. Um, I'm not exactly sure the math on that. I'm sure Zorus accounted for it much better than I could. Uh, Gino gets seven coins again. Lovely stuff. Yeah. Look at that just, pile of resources to start round three. Yeah, just incredible. He he has water one already. We're going into back-to-back -back dwelling rounds. After this, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we see that that Rickery does manage to take the the double spade here with the temporary shipping. So he does manage to get over to the east. This is great news for Claybo to finally have a neighbor to generate some passive leech and, over the next few placements. Right, and that was the five hexes for two digs there. Yeah, these these two digs get an extra black hex each, and there is that shipping ability down to the south. So in terms of getting hexes, Rickery is catching up now, though building three more dwellings only leaves him two workers for another trading post, so that's not ideal. Right, so this is the difficulty of where alchemists put themselves and how they're going to balance the round scoring, because this round is telling you to build trading posts, but you're so far behind on dwelling placement, and then the next two rounds are telling you to build dwellings, but you want to get them all out here, so it's a right. really difficult position for, for alchemists. It's, it's not synergized the way you'd really like it to be. Right. Um, um, whereas, as Twitch chat has pointed out, I think that's Hubert over there, uh, best spectator in all of Terra Mystica. Um, four trading posts by Gino this round puts him at 58 VP on the pass. And 58 after round three in a game where you don't have to be worse than second, or you have to be first or second, seems quite good. Yeah, yeah. And then again, uh, going into round four and round five, you're compensating for your lack of Earth one by having back to back dwelling rounds. So you just put down the, you just get your worker economy back up to where you want it to be for round six. And then you're forming your towns, you're capturing spaces on the map, and you're just, you know, you're scoring a lot. And it's, it's all really good for mermaids, I think. Yep. They're, they're still planning to hammer this track as we kind of predicted to open the game with. Um, Zorus has done a fairly good job with the track, I think. Not quite as spread out as we might have expected uh, Nomads to be by this stage, but went for two temples instead of uh, a more spread out opening. Yeah, and, and as we were saying, we might not well see the benefit of the two temples for Nomads until all the way at the end of the game where all of a sudden they're not scoring fewer than four points on any cult or something like that. Right. You know? Right, though... I mean, that water cult is closing up pretty fast. There's only one spot left. Yeah. Um, Zorus might just be trying to get two air priests here, though dwarves probably will have something to say about that. It looks a lot to me like dwarves are, in fact, going to go for a bridge and a trading post this round uh, to to take the two key town before anybody else can, can get it. Yeah, that seems like a good plan. Uh, with with a lack of other things to do. Having a trading post out is always nice for dwarves. If you have your worker backbone already established, Claybo won't exactly have that. Yeah. But uh, uh, but again, it's like, what is dwarves, uh, what are dwarves up to this round besides that? That's the difficult question. Right, they need spades and they, needs work, they need workers to tunnel. And Claybo's spent was that two single dig actions so far this game? Single dig being uh, significantly more inefficient than the double dig action. Um, so, and 
maybe getting a cult dig here, maybe not. As you suggested, it is that spot that gets upgraded to a trading post. So I, I think it's very clear now that you you had the correct guess. It will be a bridge upcoming for Claybo unless it gets blocked. I don't know where that block would come in. Uh, Rickery, getting that stronghold down. Wow, yeah. I was wondering about this. I mean, round three is a very sensible round for Alchemist to build their stronghold, but mm -hmm. it's not clear that uh, that Rickery has the worker economy to support that. I mean, he's back down now to, you know, to zero workers, and he's basically, well, he can take some power actions and so on, but... He does have three workers just in raw conversions of power. Yeah. And that was a really sharp power to coin conversion, knowing that nomads would give him leech, nomads or mermaids. Right. So, I mean, I think Rickery has actually dug himself out of the hole a little. Didn't, I did not quite expect um, him to be able to get the stronghold here, but that certainly fixes a few problems. Yeah, I, I think I'm much more encouraged. This is exactly the sort of play that I was thinking of uh, is very encouraging for for the Alchemist player and gives him a lot of... Um, there's a lot of life let, left in his game, although I do feel like um, I'm still... Especially as this round continues on, I'm an especially big fan of what mermaids have going on. I still think Zorus is in a good position. I'm not certain that he could have economically afforded the second temple in round two but we'll see how that ends up playing out for him yeah and he's built two trading posts this turn and is out of workers though plenty of power in reserve two priests to potentially place lots of lots of stuff still potential for zorus even though he might not want any of it So we have mermaids building their first trading post of this round in uh, you know, a fine location, opting to give dwarves power before nomads. And I think that makes sense with nomads uh, being a bit short on resources here to continue their round if they want to. Wow. Wow, Rickery. Not taking a worker's action and straight passing for the ship VP tile. Yeah. I think that this is a little bit, well, okay, so maybe what he's thinking is that Zorus was about to pass for the very same tile so that Zorus could take the coins power action, upgrade shipping a couple of times, and then put down a bunch of dwellings. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, you know, it's not, it's a sensible pass because he'll probably get the workers next round, but it seems like he kind of needed to, I mean, he still needs a lot of workers. That He's so clear. short on some of these. I mean, I get that you have four dwelling spots. You're going to have four workers. It's going to be a very easy eight points for you. And then you still have easy ways to get the dwelling scoring the next round. This is playing a lot more towards the track than I think is healthy for Alchemists, just because they are so dependent on the worker income that, I mean, he's still at three dwellings on the board. This is, that's so clearly suboptimal for an Alchemist player, but, um, that's just uh, maybe a function of Rickery uh, having a deeper understanding than I do about this. Uh, Rickery has been studying, right? Uh, did any of you in chat read the group preview on Board Game Geek where Rickery revealed that he's been using alt accounts, uh, practicing his non-standard factions, doing a bunch of secret research? You know, this could just be new stuff. Yeah, this is that that 2020 Alchemist tech that nobody knows about. Um, and, oh, Claybo, not going for two keys. Somewhat unexpectedly taking the two workers, which is plenty good for, for dwarves, as, as we've suggested for the whole game. Uh, but uh, two keys is such a big thing. Yeah, I mean, two keys. So you take two workers here. I get that he can do another tunnel this round if he wants to, or just bank the workers for next round to put down some more dwellings. But the two key town gave you gave him something like, uh, four. It gave him cycling five power. It gives him a a spade cult bonus at the end of this round. I guess he still has a priest in reserve. He can still put that priest to A and get the spade. Mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe that's what. 
maybe he's thinking the only cult reward I really need is this spade, and I was never getting two of them, so I'm just going to take the workers here. So I sure, can build my dwelling. The Two Keys Town, though, does a lot of secret work in making sure you win the cult fight by the end of the game. Because if right, someone else yeah. has those two keys and you've only made one town, you just literally cannot, by the rules of the game, lock up a second cult. Um, and it looks like dwarves are fighting on both water and earth pretty hard. So to only be able to lock up one of them, you're pretty much gifting one of them to the other by not taking the Two Key Town early, is my assessment. Right, yeah. So Zorus' position, I think, is now suffering a little bit from, again, the lack of workers that are, that are present in, in a game where a lot of, where people stretched for a second temple in round two and then for a lot of trading posts in round three. He only has one dwelling on the board. And right. there are no workers presently for him to pass on the track. So is he just going to pass for more coins and try to build I mean, a couple dwellings? Yes. He does need some coins too, right? He's only going to have four at the start of next round. Yeah. Otherwise. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to guess at what Zorus might have been up to this round. Because in some ways, it looks like Zorus definitely planned his game up to here, but then didn't quite realize his worker income would be at two going into round four. Right, yeah. And if he can get a lot of... If he can get all of his dwellings down by the end of round five, I think he's still going to be in a quite good position. Um, he does already have four advanced buildings out, yeah. Yeah. He's going to, and he has a cult spade at the end of this round. I think he spends it on B2 because that unlocks two dwellings immediately. He uh, does have ship, okay. Yeah, because he just upgraded his shipping once as well. I so think I think that's probably where that gives him three access to three dwellings, assuming nothing gets dug away from him. Mm -hmm. um, he just builds three dwellings instantaneously, and then that, and then he can pass for the seven coins as opposed to having to pass for temp ship. Um, yeah, and then he would build B two A five uh, I seven, but he doesn't even have that many work. So he does pass for the coins. Okay, so uh, so you if can always can priest to a worker or. True. He does have two priest income that he doesn't seem to be hammering the cults with, and he has plenty of power. Right, yeah. So we, we should expect Zorus to get back to a really sizable worker economy by the time round five rolls around. He does have Earth 1, so he is going to be scoring two extra points per each of these uh, dwellings. His power situation, like we've talked about, is still fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I think there's still... Zorus is in a really good position still. Um, it's just a matter of him rebounding his work economy. Yes. So he can make the most of the rest of the game. Absolutely agree with that. Um, and if you're newer to Terra Mystica, um, hopefully we've made a point by mentioning worker economy to, uh, uh, about all the factions now. Not necessarily mermaids, because they actually placed a ton of dwellings early. Um, but workers are really what creates your economy in this game. Coins you can find in enough different places from past tiles, um, from power actions, from just converting raw power. It's really the workers that are a lot harder to make up if you're lacking them. And that's why we've been stressing, you know, get those workers. On the other side of things, uh, Gino's game right now is looking really strong. I mean, he already has three trading posts down. He could put down a fourth one. The question for Gino in round f rounds four and five are, how does he free up hexes to build on besides just advancing shipping and getting to some of these other remaining um, open blue hexes like I4 and H4? Because he doesn't have the power to really uh, take any spade actions and he's not going to have the surplus of workers that he would need to hard dig any hexes mm -hmm. so uh, we just had something happen yeah uh claybo oh i guess that wasn't a dig it was just claybo no, just a tunnel to g1 from, yeah from the great tunnel right yeah so i had flagged that early on as a possibility for getting over to that side it's sure. interesting that he goes for it now i'm not sure what the what the benefit of doing it this turn is but i mean it is worker economy again he does get a worker back for building the yeah. dwelling now so uh, i could also be that he wants to stall for gino's past tile i guess that's possible 
Yeah, I mean, he still has the cult bump here, so he has one more turn to play. I mean, Gino, Gino either wants temp shipping or the the big building scoring. The big building is pretty good for him, I would suggest, just because he is down to three dwellings now. He's already got all the power and coin income he can get from his trading posts. I think the the two worker tile is quite good for him. It is two thirds of a day get worst. That's right. Yeah. That's something that people, I mean, one of the earliest things that you learn about improving your play is to try to not hard dig. Um, yes. Of course, then when you learn about dwelling rushes and so on, those calculations can change. But the big building scoring, you really can't think of as two thirds of a spade because that is what it is. So um, once you have yeah, a good worker economy, once you have a good worker economy, not yeah. before then. Don't do it before then. Uh, a lot of people in the Twitch chat talking about where uh, Claybo is going to stick this cult spade. And uh, for my money, it just seems like the green G3 hex to I would have completely facilitate agreed with his that. connection. Yeah. The other option is to just do that uh, that red D7 um, that alchemists are going to be building next to a couple times next round. It will get you a town faster. And if you don't think that you're if that green hex is under too much contest and if you want to take a few risks or if you think you're just not winning network anyway, even if you do connect, then why not go for the faster town? Right. Yeah. Um, and I mean, if I had to guess at who's losing network, it would be dwarves. Yeah. I think that that's pretty reasonable. Although um, I feel like mermaids do struggle a little bit to really get a massive network out of this position. Um, we'll see what Gino ends up doing, but especially with Black in the game, I'm not certain that mermaids have what it takes to come third on network. Fair. Um, the way the past tiles break here is that mermaids actually take the priest that had two coins lying on it. Uh, just one coin, sorry. And uh, that leaves dwarves getting the workers, which is... Which is uh, yeah, this is quite nice for dwarves, for sure. Um so to me, this just says this just flags Gino as uh, upgrade shipping twice, build on those two blues. Yeah, um, Rickery getting a very clean uh, double dig, dig into yeah. landscape here. I think right. it's about that time. And for people that don't know what the Alchemist landscape does, is it allows you to increase your shipping and your digging efficiency without spending. The, wor- the priest that would normally be required. So it saves you two priests and it also gives you a bunch of tempo because you do two, you roll two actions into one. Um, right. Alchemists take this uh, yellow hex away from Nomad, so they do end up getting this. Their connection is now totally secured. Uh, so we will see Alchemists likely, well, they'll definitely compete on network. They might end up winning it. Um, I'm not certain that. Like, I think Rick Rhea has done a lot here to bolster his position. I'm still not certain that he's done enough to win. Yeah, the thing is, if Rick Rhea had four workers here instead of two, I would like his position so much more. Admittedly, he's not far from that. He's just a couple leech away from being able to take the two workers action. But he's also missing water one right now. He doesn't have a clear time to put his trading posts up to get even more buildings down once he's once he finishes that first wave of dwellings. It it just does seem limited in my perspective. Uh yeah, we see Gino here take act five to well the single spade action to to lock up this hex. So when landscapes are not in play, very sh- very frequently a bridge gets built between those two blue hexes in the yeah. east in the west to facilitate a mermaid's town. With the landscape, usually the landscape just goes on one of those two hexes, and then that sorts that out. Right. Um, I think this specific dwelling is not right from Rickery. I think Rickery should be building out in the northeast first, um, get a leech or two from dwarves, uh, and then be in line to take the two workers' action. Right, yeah. So Rickery built uh, in a way that gives dwarves the leech, but he could have built in a... He could have built at the the northern part of the eastern continent in a way that would have anticipated Claybo building dwellings there this round and then get some leech for himself. I agree with you. I think that that was the way to go. Um, not not a big deal, but it's just a little thing. No, um, yeah. 
So the seven coins action lasted until now this round. Typically, in a high-level game, we see the seven coins action being hotly contested, and that's partly a function of getting workers sorted out first and then finding all the coins you can, which does end up being the most mathematically efficient. People have done the math on this, as one might expect when we're all nerds. Um, so it just turns out that building a worker economy and uh, trying to hammer that seven coins action is the most efficient way to get your resources. Uh, but, yeah. And, and Claybo also does something that is uh, always something that gives people a little bit of pause when they're about to do it, but is correct more frequently than people expect, which is burning below six available power to take a power action. So Claybo can no longer take the double spade action for the rest of the game. Um, but he's probably thinking that this round and the next round will be strong enough for him to uh, place all of his dwellings down to build up a very reasonable worker economy and just not have any hexes that he really needs to to take right. the double spade with. Right. I mean, if you look at the, the grays that he already has access to, he's already on seven hexes right now. He has five in the east to 12, and then one more in the south is 13 and with no more digs. So yeah, it only is really one or two more digs for a 14 or 15 network which is, you know, depending on the game, either good enough to win or sometimes third. Um, nomads are a bit small right now. Alchemists are a bit small right now. 14 might be second place by the end of the game, which is just one hard dig. You don't need to advance dig or save power for digs when you're doing that. We do see that Zorus uh, ended up using his cult spade on E3. Mm -hmm. rather than on b2 where i had suggested right. so that that made it so that he could place one fewer dwelling this round i wonder if he was worried that uh that dwarves were actually threatening that e3 hex or if he's just looking for leech from I mermaids is it yellow he's most worried about alchemist double digging it right like if he had cult dug b2 then alchemist would have double dug it with their first action Right. I guess that's the move that he was afraid of. It does seem less efficient here. We still see Zorus having all this power, and gosh, that's 11 full power in reserve if he burns one. Now it's 12. What's that power going to do? The premium power actions have been taken so quickly. Yeah. he. It's not often that you see players so flush with power, but with so little to do with it. Yeah. And then... Uh, uh, I'm just confused more than anything, I guess. Yeah. I mean, and now we see Gino in the position that we anticipated. His shipping is up to three. There are two uh, blue hexes that he has access to if he builds all Even the way the south, down yes. south and then across to the east. Um, he probably does go for that. I don't really see what else his round is consisting of. Well, there um, is the option to pass for the trading post bonus. Um, Zorus might be having a hard look at that one. Um, alchemists might be wanting out of the round pretty soon. They did turn a priest to a worker, it looks like. They didn't send it to a cult. Yeah, they turned a priest into a worker um, to place a third dwelling down this round. That's okay. Um, it, it's going to be a little battle for some past tile action here, going into rounds five and six. One detail about these later round passes is can you take a pass tile in round five in a way that also sets you up to get a good pass tile for round six um for that to happen you have to try to line up the right number of actions in round five and be willing to pass immediately after the person before you does so yeah, that would yeah. letting someone get a good pass tile now and passing to the one that they just occupied, perhaps. Um, yeah, and that's a that's one of those skills that takes just hundreds of games for players to become really adept at. Yes, um, and I think and in the last three rounds, it's absolutely crucial, um, especially in a game like this where you see repeated uh, round bonuses in rounds four and five, and. Mm -hmm. Um, then, and you have factions like mermaids in the game who just make such fantastic use of the the shipping scoring, as well as alchemists. Alchemists are passing right. for nine points with that tile very early in the game. Um, mm -hmm. 
I think Gino in in this position, I if I'm Gino, I might have even skipped placing that dwelling just now and just gone immediately for the trading post pass tile yeah. because it's uh, so many points. It's so crucial. Trying to read who gets the pass tiles in this round. I think the first passer has um, a chance at going for the empty big building pass tile in round six. Right. And we see that Rickery is the first passer. Um, now, Rickery doesn't have any trading post built. He also doesn't have water one. He still goes for the trading post pass tile. It does have a, a worker on it. Those are absolutely crucial for Alchemist. I'm wondering if his plan this round somehow... Well, it probably involves... It, it definitely involves building some trading posts to free up dwellings that he can build. And I would I'm suggest it else. involves advanced dig also. Right. I'm wondering what else it involves. Because again, it's a little bit clunky. If you're Alchemist here... Do you want to put down a second dwelling? Do you want to upgrade your temple to a sanctuary that's never going to be part of a town? It, there are still problems with Alchemist's game, but he does. His points are getting up there. Now, of course, they're not... Uh, Gino's well, Gino, locked. Yeah, but Gino is now locked out of a scoring bonus tile this round. I So it seems like the that last dwelling that Gino placed was, in fact, very costly for him. He could not have afforded... Uh, that particular play he needed to pass that round for one of the bonuses for the trading right. post bonus. Um, I wonder what his pivot is now, because this is like one of those spots for mermaids that you never want to be in. You're not on a, a bonus tile in round five, and the players who are on those bonus tiles are notorious for being able to drag rounds out. Yes. Um, I would say especially advanced dig alchemists. Alchemist, so right. Those rounds can take absolutely forever. Yeah. Um, so it does look like if Gino somehow manages to not take first or second here, I think you'd have to blame it on that pass, missing that pass. Ah, uh, so we see this is this is something I was really worried about for Alchemist, and I don't know that it's correct for Claybo to do this, but Claybo builds a third temple and takes Whoa. water one. Taking the last copy. And and this is now, I mean, Alchemists weren't close really to Water One. They would have had to build their sanctuary to get it up in one turn. But not having Water One for Alchemists is so hard here because you're spending so much. You're spending victory points to build your trading post because you have to do so many victory point to coin conversions as Alchemists yeah. to get these trading posts up. And now your best hope for scoring them is that you build your sanctuary in round six and take Air One for four points. It is extremely underwhelming. I mean, you do have the two coins back for trading post rebate on your pass tile, but that's really not how you wanted to use it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so you're just going to like net lose two workers and a point this round for each trading post and get the coins back next round. Yeah. So there's the dig advance that you predicted. Very reasonable. Um, Alchemists do so much with advanced digging. They cycle power incredibly efficiently. They get a lot of dwellings down. So this is all good standard alchemist stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what Zorus is going to be up to exactly. It looks like a, a double dig here. Yeah, he still I mean, has 12 coins. And it's only four workers to start the round with. It's so interesting because it seems like for the third round in a row, we're like, Zorus hasn't revealed what he's up to yet. Yeah. Uh, he has all this power. Uh, can we just keep saying that and be right? Yeah, I mean, something has to, it has to be something explosive here from Zorus to start conversing. This is the problem with nomads that we highlighted as early as the auction, which is they don't have a way to score inherently. It has to come down to what's available to everybody in the game. Right. Um, so, yeah, so we do see these two digs, and Zorus decides to build. Oh, interestingly, he decides to build first on this uh, E2 hex rather yeah. than building on B2. I wonder what that's about. It must be something about the leech situation, if I had to guess. Um, Gino had capacity to... Um, it's just a very friendly leech spot to build B2 first. I don't think that makes it bad, um, especially when advanced dig alchemists are around. I mean, it's possible that, you know... Alchemists are like, well, nomads, I can limit you to doing even more of nothing right now. 
if I take this yellow away, why shouldn't I just single dig it to brown and see what happens? Yeah, that's yeah, that's and that's just this is the stage of the game that alchemists are at. They're so scary with advanced digs. They, it's just so easy for them. And uh, can they try to secure second place on like a one twenty five score if if Zorus loses network and doesn't have cult redemption and yeah. Alternatively, for alchemists, they do have the makings of of three towns, uh, and so I think you're gonna have to the calculation of interfering with other people's hexes is going to be very difficult because I think as alchemists you still have pretty high hopes that you're gonna be able to score three towns um, in round six. Mm -hmm. So you might just want to devote your workers primarily to ensuring that those hexes are. Are set up um, right as, as you point out like rickery doesn't have a ton of workers to deal to play with um and that might be what zorus is gambling on um we also saw gino take the single spade instead of seven coins um a little interesting but as we've stated he needs to get a few more hexes here and that uh that c4 hex he just dug to apparently set up a sanctuary town uh makes some pretty good sense yeah um I think that if I'm mermaids here, I would have liked ad to advance dig, honestly. Uh, I think that the... Well, because the the Act act 5, the single spade action, is inefficient compared to um, to the other to the Certainly. double spade. Yeah. You have the ability to take coins. So the coin cost right. of the of the advanced dig is a little bit diminished. You don't need more than three ship you're done. Your shipping situation yeah. is fine the way that it is. Unless you're holding that big pass tile in round five or six, you typically don't want to advance ship pass three with mermaids on this map. Right. And and uh, you see that if Gino had gone for an advanced dig here, it would have costed him I two think workers. Seven points in advanced dig makes a lot of sense the more you say it. And I think it sets you up in uh in the last round to um you know, like advanced digging is also worth points, right? Like, yes. It's not like you're not doing anything. If you advance digging twice, you still get 12 points out of it. So, yeah. I mean, I think Gino's still in a decent spot. Next round, he's going to get a Sanctuary and take uh, either Air 1 or Fire 2, whichever ends up scoring him a lot of points. Um, he might go a temp He might take a Temple and go Air 1 now just to get some more passive point earning. I'm not exactly sure. This is like this is where the game gets so difficult to evaluate what count what's optimal, you know. I would yeah, I would assume Gino's just trying to turn that temple into a sanctuary next round for Air One. Um by not advancing digging, that maybe hints to me that he's going to send another priest or two to fire here. Um that certainly gives him more than just the cult bonus because, you know, fire's kinda open right now. Is this is a hard dig from Claybo with a tunnel gonna turn a priest into a worker? Yeah, and build that dwelling. Guarantee connection. And I mean you can see these connection numbers as much as we can here. Nomads are last in network. They have access to two more hexes this round right now, but they're gonna end this round at eleven. You have alchemists upgraded digging. Mermaids are at 12. They have a fair few green and black hexes to dig later. Um, I guess in that same vein, nomads have plenty of reds and browns they can dig. So I guess mermaids or nomads are losing network this game. Yeah, and as we mentioned, you know, it's pretty impressive for Claybo to fight for network position. Um given that he had no neighbors whatsoever in the east at the beginning of the game and his spade uh, problems were manifest from the start of the game. But this um, this great tunnel placement was very crafty. It opened up a lot of extra gray hexes for him out in the west. And yep. he still has a couple natural grays to tunnel to without having to do anything in the way of digging. So he'll just get to 14 structures for free and then it'll yep. be a matter of if he needs to push um, one more or not. Yeah. So I think it's about time we do one more evaluation on who we think is ahead here. Um, and 
I mean, we've seen Rickery make a pretty good push these last two rounds. I think he's out of fourth place. I mean, I kind of want to say Zorus is fourth here. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, um, I think that mermaids are um, probably doing fine right now. Um, it seems like they've gotten all the buildings they want. That advanced digging line that they didn't take is uh, is really feels like almost a lost cause. So that's two things for mermaids we've thought were potentially useful um, in passing for a trading post and uh, going for advanced dig. Both didn't happen. Rickery takes the seven coins. As someone or maybe multiple people pointed out in Twitch chat, alchemists do like taking the seven coins action late if um, if it starves everyone else of them. Um, and especially in a round where Rickery's saying with his past tile, I want to build uh, a bunch of trading posts, you know, having seven coins here is seven points. You just turned four power into seven points. What's wrong with that? Um, and as as you mentioned earlier, Daniel, the, these these town spaces for alchemists are still very possible to hit. Um, I would even think that Rickery uh, goes for one of them this round. Probably the the town uh, town spaces that are currently next to the stronghold. Um, that's just a trading post and a dwelling away. That's four workers. You can get two back on the town bonus, um, and you probably have enough power by then to take the two workers action. There's just a lot of ways at, if you're alchemists that you can just like out of thin air almost if you're a viewer create these workers and that that is a really fun way to play um let's see so zorus is just gonna build these dwellings uh he's got that uh a5 or b1 option with this last worker that he has in the supply he could turn another priest into a dwelling um so that is what zorus is doing this round uh, we already see that Claybo has passed. Uh, do you think that's... Uh, I think that's probably a good pass for Claybo. Guaranteeing the seven coins action. He's maxed out his worker income. He's going to be at 10 workers, uh, 12 workers to start next round. And 8 plus the seven coins action, 15 coins. Claybo has set himself up uh, for a good round six starting position, I would suggest. Yeah, and you see from the way Claybo's uh, situation is where he has water one, he has the big building scoring, and the round is big building scoring. Like, Claybo just has a, a a huge number of ways to score points. He has two free grays to tunnel to. Like, there's an enormous number of ways for Claybo to make, a, like, a lot of points next round, which is quite good for him. His biggest uh, problem, I would say, is that he's... One occult, but he's not really certain to win another. I think if Claybo can win a second cult and get to twenty plus cult points here, his chances go way up. Yeah, uh, yeah. But until that, that happens, uh, I'm not convinced. Just being at sixty four right now doesn't seem great, even with the extra sources you were pointing out. So one big question that I've been thinking about these last few minutes is: Where did it go wrong for nomads? What what happened with with Nomad's game? Like we were so confident of what their spot looked like in round one and even partway through round two. And now all of a sudden they're last on points, their scoring opportunities in round six aren't bad, but it doesn't seem like it can make up the gap. Yeah. What, what was it that went wrong in Zorus's game plan? What I would say, um, and one of what one of my most recent experiences suggest, is that Zorus didn't go all out on any strategy. Um, I had thought that early on in the game, and I think you might have also, that Zorus was going to go for an extremely high cult nomads game with these two temples. But after those first priests to earth and air, I mean, the nomads cult game doesn't look amazing right now. Um, so to not use that second temple to either hammer the shipping VP card or get a bunch of cult points, um, he didn't take a network route either by building Stronghold or expanding early. I think just... And he had so many resources in power the whole time and maybe didn't get enough good power actions. Just not being able to spend stuff or 
not spend stuff efficiently is where I would say things have not gone well for him. Yeah. And, and, and uh, all of that is to say that it seems like the first thing is the second temple. Uh, yeah. It's probably the, the beginning of the end for, for Nomads' game plan, which is, you know, a valuable lesson, I think, for, for people who are watching who are sort of newer to the game is that queuing very close to the round scoring track, especially in the early rounds of the game, does not always uh, produce the sort of dividends that you would hope. And this is a prime example of that. Right. Yeah, that's a big deal. Uh, we also saw Nomads take the workers' action, uh, denying it from Rickery. That's that's not what you like to see if you're Rickery. That's right, yeah. Uh, the, the, partial, the struggle for alchemists and workers continues. Although Rickery's position has um, improved to a point where He's still he's still doing okay. His game yeah. is he's gonna form a town here. Uh, there is still a worker town available. He'll be very happy about taking that. Um, mm -hmm. We do see that Gino went for Gino went for air one on a temple this round, and he also I, rebuilt a trading post to get back to four trading posts. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that. I think that what this says, though, is that Gino is content to not capture any network points. Yes, um, he's he just doesn't seem to have the digging capabilities that he might need to to even get third. Yeah, and of and of course, if you want to, if you want to capitalize on big building scoring next round and potentially score as many as three towns, um, then well, I don't even. We, we will have to start crunching the numbers on how much he has going for him. I don't think that that trading post made a tremendous amount of sense if he's thinking about three towns. And why wouldn't he be? Second Temple for Air 1 tells me Sanctuary for Fire 2, which tells me three towns. But now I yeah. feel like his economy is too far behind to, to make all three of them. Yeah, let's take a look. So he's making eight coins and seven workers as it is. Um, I agree the trading post was more likely to be good. Uh, what is that hex? F2? Uh, below the Nomad's most western outpost there. Um, I think that would have been yeah. possibly a better trading post spot um, to try to get those three towns. But maybe, maybe Gino's just eyeing uh, his uh, initial dwelling on E4 as a stronghold space. And that would easily get a power value of six for a town there, including a landscape. Right, yeah. So I think it probably didn't end up mattering if we look at uh, a stronghold and a sanctuary and a landscape as the plan. Uh, that's an expensive plan. That's uh, eight and 14, eight workers, 14 coins just for those two buildings. Uh, so it's going to be coin short of that. And we also see the position for... Uh, Gino that he was sort of hoping to not have to be in. I don't think that it's going to end up mattering uh, because he already has a way to stall, but it's he was very close to not having a way to stall. And that's yeah. because uh, Zoros only has one action left, I think. One legal action is to put a priest somewhere. Um, that might cycle him enough power to burn yeah, for burn. something, but yeah. Um, and I mean, denying mermaids those points could be worth it. Right. So, so we'll, we'll see, see what Zoros does. Yeah. He would certainly like to win this fight if he can, but it's, well, if Zoros can take more actions, then alchemists will have to pass. Yeah. Right. So I think, I think Zoros is content to put his priest somewhere to Earth. Because, most likely, yeah. Yeah. Right. Because, um, and then mermaids will follow suit, even though putting a priest to earth is not very effective for mermaids. They just need to stall. Well, they might put it in fire or something just to get one extra bump and create some separation between right. uh, Zorus and, and himself. Um, and then alchemists will be forced to pass, getting off of the trading post tile, not ending up on a specific scoring tile, but ending up maybe on something like six coins, which is basically the same as six points for alchemists. Um, I think it might not actually be at this point. Um, Rickery's making 13 coins by by his own faction ability here. Um, that's probably not enough. 19 is better. 
it's hard for me to exactly count that right now. But yeah, and and if there were pass tiles with workers, I would say I it would be it would be a no brainer. I think just pass for the workers. Ozorus oh, instead of sending the priest, uh, burns some power, gets some coins back, turns the priest to a worker, and builds this dwelling. And I think yeah. that's perfectly reasonable too. Yeah, given how guaranteed the alchemist passes. Right. That's right. Yeah. I think it's really, I think it's really savvy for Gino to bow out of the network fight because everybody's on twelve structures right now. It's going to be yeah. mayhem in round six for who's going to end up winning network, and people are going to necessarily end up um, going slightly suboptimal on their pure point scoring mm -hmm. to to maximize the chance of winning network. Um, yeah. And but Gino just but Gino can just say I'm good. I'm just gonna play the track really so, hard. The problem for Gino is if he try if he doesn't try to win network, where are his points coming from? He has lost whatever point lead he had at the end of round three. Remember, he had like 58 at the end of round three. Here we are at the end of round five. He's at 73. His game really hasn't gone super far. He needed those pass tiles and yeah. is kind of struggling to do useful things that aren't getting onto the pass tiles. Right, yeah. The pass the pass to not end up on the trading post scoring this round is uh, is definitely not good for... Mm -hmm. that. That's it, turning out to be a quite pivotal moment as well for Gino. Right. So, I mean, Alchemists are already on 85. They are likely the ones who will win network. If they Just can score that. two more yeah. towns... If they can score two more towns and win network... Um, Alchemist might actually be winning the game. Uh, he does miss out on a points tile here, though, and does take it with a coin. Yeah. Which is, I mean, maybe useful for defending one of these cults that he might get two points in. But otherwise, I'm not sure I see the point of taking the priest instead of six coins. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not clear on what the priest is doing, but I still... It's going to be... I think that things might depend a lot on whether or not Gino ends up with the kind of uh, the ability to form a third town. Ah, I think if the he, third town is pr well. I don't know. It, we'll see what these digs if these digs happen. For who Clavo takes the very expected seven coins he's been waiting twenty minutes to take. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he passed so early to make sure he got that, but it hundred percent worth it. Yeah, Rickery is going to build a temple here. I expect it would be air one. Yeah, there's still a couple left. Um, uh, actually, takes fire two. So this oh. is he thought this fire is him two saying, would be more contested, huh? Yeah. So this is uh this is Rickery saying this is how I'm getting three towns. I don't see. I don't think Zorus goes for fire two here. Zorus is settling for two towns. It looks like. I I don't see a way Zorus gets three towns either. Yeah. yeah. And as nomads, you you really hate to do that. Um, yeah, that's not two town nomads is always a sort of is a belated sort of thing, I think. Right. Um, as you've mentioned, and as I've mentioned as well, like you just hunt those points as nomads, and towns are one of the major ways you kind of need to get them. Uh, so Gino has, if he converts everything to workers and coins, has 12 workers, 16 coins. What did I say he needed? He needed eight workers and 14, 14 coins. coins yeah so he has three priests a worker and two coins extra on top of just building the stronghold building the sanctuary um he does have those resources and of course the town bonuses for whatever he elects to take with the town bonuses right i would suggest that a six coin town maybe just one of them would be quite good for gino to make sure to get that ad last advanced ship bump yeah. Um, so one thing I was considering is, does Gino take the double dig action to uh, place his landscape, place a dwelling uh, in the northeast for that town, and then find a way to to get the third town from there? I mean, I think that just gets him the three towns. I think yeah. that's a great plan. Um, the hex Gino will want to dig is D1. 
uh, definitely that green compared to the other green option uh, in the Northwest, because that other green option, if he leaves it blue, is alchemist food, and you don't want that. Yeah. Um, and the reason he has to leave a hex blue is because if he places the landscape down, he will need to uh, do that immediately on the dig action. So Zorus get it, gets in there with the two key town in round six, now leading three cults. Uh, very short on resources. The network looks like it might stagnate at around 12 or 13. Yeah, so channeling my inner Rainier here, to me this felt like double eight point towns for Zorus rather than the two key town. The allure of the two key town is always there. Like it, It's a big bump right off the bat. You do get to cycle a lot of power immediately. But, I mean, it's... Um, he's so down on points. It's round you know? six. Get your points. Yeah. Like, it's not the right time to build your econ here. Like, certainly, so, you, you know, if you're short on resources, you're short on resources, but it means that your your previous game, uh, the previous parts of your game probably just didn't line up the way they should have. Um, so I agree. Uh, going for a pointier town, more risky on the cults, probably would have been the best line, given that it's Starting to become pretty clear he's not going to be in competition for network here. I think, yep, and it's the, the double dig, but it is the wrong green hex. That's right, yeah. Uh, it's the wrong green hex. Uh-oh, we'll see what Rickery decides to do about this, but Rickery can certainly blow that up. Yeah, this is, this is one of those spots that uh, we talked about earlier where alchemists with their digging advanced just end up being so scary. Um, even more, you would have to say like way more dangerous when it comes to interference than like the prototypical blocking faction like giants, for yes. instance. And so I like like this is one of those spots where Rickery has to really pause and ask himself, do I just do I get to advance if I dig this hex right now? Right, and Rickery has to look at his own uh, board, and I assume he did, and found out he just needs to make sure he gets those two workers. I don't know who was contesting them. Maybe he didn't feel confident spending that three quarters of a worker on that dig. Um, right. So we we often quote alchemists as having like a fraction of a worker as the dig cost. Um, this was a shower thought to me not too long ago. It's often quoted as two thirds of a worker, but I think it's three quarters of a worker. It costs three workers to get four, accounting for the power back on digs. So that makes it three quarters of a worker. Right. Anyway, um, it's hard to see how not digging away that mermaid's hex was bad. Um, I think just converting power into a worker first and going for it would have been a good call for Rickery, but yeah. he goes very conservative here. And I, it was, um, I haven't really done the math on Rickery's uh, dwelling count, but it seemed to me like it might have been possible for him to even place a dwelling there and still manage to get the three towns. Probably not. He probably is still building his sanctuary for air one, I would guess. Um, I think that's a good guess. So, okay, so that we do see the coin town for, for Gino. So right. the I think even the... Even the coin coin town snobs in the chat will understand that this was necessary for him getting to his third yeah, town. With extra priests, you have the shipping pass tile. This is totally fine. This is just better than the ship town. Um, and the cults, I mean, they're kind of messy, but they're kind of well defined with all the with all the uh, priest spots taken. And so here we go with this is such an interesting thing. This has happened twice now. Claybo built a third temple to take water one. This has to be a sanctuary to take Fire air two. one. Oh, air one. Which means that which means that Rickery cannot get it. That would be unfortunate uh, for Rickery. Um, I think not reading that nomads don't have a third town chance um, could could be costly here. Um, in terms of who I think is winning, I think it's mermaids at this point. Mermaids are deceptively fine on the cults. They have like 12 points there right now, as it stands. 
Um, they seem to be getting network points eventually. They're going to be have a ton of passing points, maybe up to 19 passing points. Um, so I think I like mermaids most here. Yeah, I, um, I'm seeing some comments in the chat that I think I agree with that I don't know that this was the right set of moves for Claybo to go for. Um, I, mean, I do. Six Sanctuary is certainly not cheap. Yeah, and I get that you take air one away from alchemists, um, but there had to be—I think there had to be a better line for Claybo to score points for himself this round than than going this way. Um, yeah. Zorus builds his stronghold, which gets him literally exactly to a second town with a sandstorm and a hard conversion of a priest to a worker and a worker to a coin and burning power for a coin. Uh, he doesn't need to do that, actually, because he has the landscape. Oh, yeah, that's right. He could just uh, he could just sandstorm and place the landscape. That's right. And, you know, that could get him to 14 structures if he takes the ship town and goes for this last yellow in the southeast, yeah. southwest. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. And that 14th uh, structure might be... It ties him with curves. It might tie him with mermaids. It might be a situation where... Uh, okay, so the 11-point town gets taken by Gino. Very nice for him. Um, it might be a situation where we have one al uh, network winner, an alchemist, and three people tying for the second, third, and fourth spots. And what is that points-wise? That's 18 divided by three is six each. Yeah, and I think that that's uh, I think that that's six points that Gino is gonna feel pretty happy about getting because I don't think that he he Gino has not exerted himself for those network points at all. They they fit perfectly into scoring yeah. his trade his uh, dwellings in rounds four and five, and then getting exactly enough structures down to form his three towns this round. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think if you're if you're Gino, you're feeling pretty pretty good. I think. Right. And I mean, you could even take another coin town here. Um, it's that or a ship town to make sure that you get uh, to five shipping, right? Yeah. I mean, he's won, five, he's won the fire cult. Uh, Zorus can't really do anything with the number of priests that Gino has to contest that. Um, Gino can maybe inch up uh, some other cult. He can maybe try to he can rebuild his fourth trading post um, right. after he builds the stronghold. Zorus does lock up two cults simultaneously here with the right. another cult town. So in a sense, this, this two key town is providing quite a bit of power now with these last steps in earth and air. Right. But, but as things stood earlier in the game, you know, What's the power doing for him? It does get him a 14 structure, like we said. So you very keen of you to remember about the landscape. Of course, unfortunately, the Nomad's landscape, a little bit underwhelming, does require a trading post on the board for it to be built in the first place. Um, does get Zorus to 14 structures, but 14 structure Nomads, you kind of hate to see it. Yep. You would hope that they're pushing. Pounds. Yeah. So Zorus is going to place down this last dwelling. He has, it looks like he'll have one point of resources left. So two points for the dwelling, one point for resources is three. He passes for four plus three is seven. That's 10. He might get six network is 16. And cults look likely to be 20. So Zorus plus 36 is my initial projection, which puts him at 129. I don't think that that's going to be... Yeah, unfortunately, I don't see that how that's going to be near enough. Um, here's one thing that's going on now with the connection. For, well, two things. First of all, how is Claybo even getting to 14 structures? He still has to... He, Does he, has have to tunnel. he has to do a trading post and two dwellings. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, without a stronghold, those those jumps cost two still. So you're right. He might not get to 14. And then on the other side of things, uh, Gino could eschew 
some points for stronghold and so on, but get to 15 structures. Is 15 going to tie Alchemists? That'll end up being the question. Uh, yeah, so that's an issue, right? Alchemists are already at 14. They can do trading post and dwelling to get to 15. And then they don't have workers, but they are getting another town somehow. Hard to say. Um, they probably take the power town. Uh, no, the priest town's just better. They take priest towns as one worker. So right now, if they use their priests and power as workers, then alchemists have five, six, seven workers, maybe eight. And I think that's probably enough to get them to 16. So I'm not sure fighting for 15 is that good. Yeah, and we see that Gino actually doesn't go for it. So I think he makes the right call here. He's in a bit of a weird spot. He has three priests and five power in bull too. I think this is just a uh, rebuild a trading post for four points. What about send priest to fire? You get oh, three power and a advanced ship. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's way better. Obviously, yeah, yeah. So that's what that's what I think. Uh, that's what Gino's going to do. He gets his shipping to five. That's worth an enormous number of points. He locks up the fire cult, which I think he virtually had won anyways, but sure, yeah, he gets there. Um, so yeah, and of course now he has he has enough to advance Fair shipping place. once more. That's five points for advancing shipping for mermaids to five, and then he passes for an additional three points, so it's quite a nice action. Yeah, um, so to try to figure out mermaids' final score here, sitting at 114 right now, a five point action for 119. You pass for 15 plus three is 18, so 137. Uh, six on network if we're being conservative to 143. Fire gets them to 151, water to 155, and these last two cults to 159 for Gino. Yeah, wow. That's, uh, that's going to get Gino a spot in the final. I feel pretty confident in saying yeah, that. I, I don't think that we need to to hesitate in in congratulating Gino on getting through at some stage. It'll be I think I think Gino will want to win the game outright. It'll be very nice for him to have won both of his bracket games going into yep. the, the finals. Um, and where did our producer rank Gino in the preview? Huh? Dead last both times. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to maybe interview our producer afterwards instead of the winner. Um, either way, in considering who else is going to be advancing with Gino, we already established that Zorus is expecting to end up right around one thirty. Uh, oh, thank you, Logos. I'm sorry. It's Gino. Yeah. Every time, every time he wins, you have to add O's on. Yeah. Um, so, Rickery, what's up the sleeve here? You're going to win Network for 18 points. You've got another two towns coming for approximately 15 points. Uh, two points on the Cults. So you're about plus 35, plus 37, counting the two points for Dwelling. So that would put him at about 124. Um, that's actually below Zora. Yeah, wow. The the race for second is incredibly tight right now. One, one of the things I think is going to make Claybo a little sad is I'm not certain that the line he took this round was optimal for him. Mm -hmm. And I think not tying second place on network with 14 structures is going to feel uh, really bad. I mean, those are six-point dwellings. They're four for the tunnel and two for the dwelling with Earth-1. I mean, I right. it's just straight up better than building your big buildings. I'm not sure what advantage Claybo got from getting a temple and a stronghold. Yeah. Yeah, so what is Claybo... So what's Claybo passing for right now? Uh, he gets eight points on his pass style. He gets two points on a one, so that's ten. He has one network. No, he gets no points for network, but he 16. has 16 cult points. So that's 26 points. So, yeah, no, unfortunately. So, if Rickery can get 
five extra points of value from these towns compared to what I was expecting, uh, that should put him equal with Zorus. Right. Uh, Zorus actually has an extra resource point here. I think I actually p factored that in, in the calculation. Uh, this is very tight between Rickery and Zorus here. Zorus yeah, and I think lock in 22 cult points, 124, and then nine network is 133. Yeah, oh, that's right. So in our previous calculation of Zorus's points, the assumption was that Quabo was making it to 14 structures, but now that right. he hasn't, Zorus is in a slightly better position. I'm not sure alchemists are getting there. Um, I, I'm not sure I see it either. There's no easy cult to sneak two points in. He's far away um, in terms of using those priests. It costs him three workers to get another building out, but that extra building doesn't do a lot. Um, it gets him a town, I suppose. And so, I think, I think, funny enough, uh, Alchemists, we were convinced, had a very bad start. Their economy stuttered for a long time early on in the game. This, So what that says to me is that with a slightly more encouraging track for Alchemists and a slightly better early game, Alchemists could have, you know, would have advanced for sure. But things just didn't line up. It wasn't that good of a game for Alchemists in the first place. And then Rickery got off to a very slow start. So I think Rickery will feel a little bit hard done when, when all is said and done that he could have gotten there. Yeah. If, if he doesn't. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, Rickery doesn't need another building. So I think Rickery's move is to convert all of his resources into workers and coins, build an expensive trading post, get his town and get out of here. Um, the best town is, oh, and we see that uh, we'll have to explain the moves. It is a sanctuary for Rickery instead of an expensive trading post. I think that's somewhat sensible. He takes what's effectively an eight point town, five points, six coins. And Earth three, which actually jumps Gino on oh. the Earth track, gives him okay. two extra two extra points there, takes away two points from Gino. Not that that two points matters even slightly. No, I think Gino is still 160. Yeah. Um, okay, so Rickery's final points, if we can be 20 seconds ahead of uh, final scoring here. Uh, three resource points, 18 network is 21, four is 25, so Rickery will be 126, short of Zorus. I think this makes it so that Gino gets first place and Zorus second, advancing out of the fire division and into the finals of season two. Yep. And it was a great game. Um, you know, I think... Pat's on the back for both of us. We said mermaids and nomads seemed like they were in the best spot after yeah. the initial dwelling placement. That ended up being true. I don't think that we had anticipated that nomads would end up so near third place as they did end up and that Gino would blow the game out the way that he did. But, uh, you know, so it goes. Yeah, I think it's just a very underwhelming performance for dwarves here, especially in the end game. Unfortunately, um, I mean, obviously, for those of you who watch a lot of the Fire Two Open, I don't perform well in round six sometimes either. Um, but you know, sometimes it just happens to the best of us. And uh, Clavo, I don't think found the most efficient points here. Um, and it's hard to say he could have gotten sixteen more than Zorus in this last round, but maybe it was there somewhere. And now, uh, now we'll await the winner, and then presumably the second place player afterwards for some uh, some brief comments on on their performance and so on. Yep. I have the esteemed pleasure of getting to interview Gino twice. Yes, that should be excellent. Uh, so. As we've stated, uh, Gino winning, Zorus getting second place and advancing to the final along with Gino, Rickery in third, making a good comeback with Alchemist, but not enough, and Claybo with 118 in a Dwarves game, which he bid uh, 15 or 16 points to play. Um, and it turns out, you know, this didn't need to have, this auction didn't need to have so many bids. Uh, the 30 point faction won, and the most expensive faction lost. Uh, and that's something you kind of see in these games sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, as we, 
as we mentioned very early on, I think Claybo has gonna is gonna feel a little hard done from the get go that he wasn't g- gifted a neighbor in the East when that's usually something that you can expect in this color wheel matchup, um, and that did make his game quite difficult. Uh, which so you know it was was a little bit hard for for Claybo. You do feel bad for him. Um, I don't think that that's what he thought was going to happen when he bid so much on dwarves, but that's the way that the cookie crumbles sometimes, you know? Yep, absolutely. I believe we have Gino coming on the line. Soon TM. Wonderful. Um, And yeah, a great, um, a great game here for Gino. Gino, are you there? Hello, guys. Hello. Hey, Gino, congrats. Thank you. Yeah, a wonderful game for you. Yeah, it worked out amazingly. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I think uh, not going for Earth Run worked out. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll be the one asking you here, like what... What did you see in this auction that led you to mermaids most? Yeah, first of all, I always like to put in mermaids or uh, cultists if there is a sanctuary stronghold in the last round. Mm -hmm. So um, I was afraid a little bit that uh, Zoras goes for uh, cultists in his third pick, because then um, I think mermaids were not such a good choice. But since he was going for nomads, it was it was perfect because nomads and uh, yellow blue in the west is always uh, a good, yeah, a good uh, combination. And um, yeah, then secondly, I was very happy that uh, uh, Rikiri didn't start at that C one. And yeah, I I saw that. So let's see. I had I had some some games previously where I had similar uh, setups and I was always afraid to go for this dwelling rush. And um, then I had one game where someone else just did it. He went for dwelling rush and crushed crushed us with 30 points. And I think I thought this is is perfectly the right time to just go for it. Dwelling rush into temple round two with uh, with TP, so with water one. And then just spread out all trading posts in round three, and so that was my game plan with mermaids. And because of that, I I went much earlier on mermaids than the others. Yeah, I think it was the right choice. <laughs> yeah, I think you won the auction by a mile. Uh, you definitely came out ahead of everybody. Uh, one moment in the mid game that gave the two of us some pause was when you didn't manage to jump on a scoring pass tile going into round five, where there was an opportunity for you to do so. You built an additional dwelling and then you missed out on uh, a scoring tile going into round five. Ultimately didn't matter whatsoever. Uh, but I was wondering if you had a genuine expectation that you'd still be able to get on one of those scoring tiles, even after that additional dwelling, or if you had just never factored a scoring tile that round into your game plan. No, I f- that was just a mistake from my side because in that moment, I just fucked one uh, wrong because I was thinking that uh, Rickery passes and Zoras too, and they pass in the, in the other direction so th- <laughs> that I can jump on a, on a victory point bonus style. That was just a mistake from my side. But I think um, at the end of the day, it was okay because I got coins. I was able to build another temple. And uh, yeah, with Air Run, I got also some points out of it. But at the end of the day, it was a mistake. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I, I, I think if I jump on the trading post style, Rickery will jump on the um, pass shipping tile. And I can I can get the next the next round the pass shipping tile too. I can get both. So um, yeah, I think it, it was it was a mistake, but yeah, it doesn't matter <laughs> at the end of the day. You certainly had plenty of margin to work with at the end there. <laughs> yeah. So my plan was in this game um, to go for a big econ game, 
and the kick on always works out if you go for dwelling rush. And so in this setup, um, it looked good that I can also make a lot of points with this uh, trading post round three. And so I I was thinking that's that's the best way because if I don't win, I think I can manage to get second with big econ. And yeah, that was my plan and I'm happy that it worked out. Yeah, and as Daniel said, we both saw that Mermaids had definitely the winning spot in this auction and we completely were on board with you selecting them when you did. Yep. So thank you so much for joining us, Gino. I believe we uh, might have one more interview with here or we're just uh, gonna end the stream. Um, okay, we do have Zorus incoming. So thank you very much, Gino. Congratulations so much on this huge win and we'll see you in the final. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye, see you. Bye. Yeah, so, uh, very, uh, very good insight from Gino. He saw some of the things that we'd uh, we'd suggested as well. Um, in that, mermaids had a very clean uh, way to use the track with with these uh, just scoring the points on the track and a dwelling rush. So, uh, oh, Zoras, welcome. Uh, I just arrived. Yes. Hey, hey. How are you guys? Hey, Zoras. Uh, congratulations on advancing to the final. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations for to Gino for an amazing game, I think. Uh, he kicked our ass here. Um, uh, I think he played very well, very well deserved. Yeah, but so, of course, you know, you advance and that's very well deserved too. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, I wanted to ask you personally about the auction in this game because <laughs> both Lumen and I thought that Mermaids had a very strong game plan coming out of the auction. And we both thought that Mermaids had a pretty good edge. And then the game ended up playing out basically the way that that we drew it up from talking through the auction. Um, you bid pretty aggressively on Nomads early on in the auction. Um, what was it about Nomads game plan that you thought was so secure? Uh, well, the thing is, to be perfectly honest with you, I think uh, you and Lumen were perfectly right. Uh, the in the end, Mermaid got a great deal at, at the end of the auction. Uh, I, it's, it's funny because um, the Dwelling Rush is one of my favorite opening with uh, Mermaids and never, never crossed my mind in this one. Uh, and, and once I saw Gino performing it, I was like, of course, <laughs> of course, it's a good game plan. Uh, and, uh, so I really kind of... Uh, blanked out there. I think I was too worried to try to figure everything out. Um, so what, what I liked about Nomad, um, it was more what I didn't like about the other factions. Uh, I felt that with uh, both Alchemist, no, well, uh, Alchemist, Nomads, and Mermaids, Mermaid might have difficulties to hit the past shipping tile. Uh, if we're talking in a world where uh, he's not... Uh, He's not doing the dwelling rush, at least. Uh, that there wasn't a past dwelling, so they cannot fall back on that. Uh, and also that um, they probably don't get Earth 1. So I, I was worried of where will the points come from, mermaids. But of course, once you do the dwelling rush, uh, and you can use the third round TP's uh, event in the way that um, in the way that Gino did, then uh, it, it kind of solved that problem because he kind of uh, got tons of points from that. So, yeah, I, I I knew Alchemists were really a very, very, very risky choice. And for not such high reward, I think in the end, Rickery played well because I, I had uh, I had him uh, in more much more difficult situation. Uh, but um, yeah, so it felt to me that uh, dwarves and nomads were the two safe choices, and that's why I was bidding on, on both of them. Gotcha. And then um, there's one, or I think there's one big idea that most of us didn't quite follow from your nomads plan, and that was to get a second temple in round two and take water one. Um, by the end of round three, it became clear that you were going to have some economic struggles without your stronghold. 
what was your original plan for having two temples out? What did you want that production to do? Um, so it's simple. Uh, first thing is, uh, so that, that's more, uh, I, I was very focused. If you go back to round one, uh, I was very, very focused not to give power to Alchemist because I didn't want him to get the single speed. Um, and that's why I put the temple in the West and also to get maximum leech from mermaids getting, um, getting the dwelling rush. So I got a ton of leech from that. Uh, but then, so if you want to do a town in the middle, you need to do it to, to, to build a second temple in the middle. And that's kind of um, uh, was well aligned with the track uh, there. Uh, usually, I would have gone, I, I never go for water one in round two. Uh, and I, I hesitated a very long time before getting to water one, uh, before taking water one. Uh, and I still, I still think that it might have been a mistake. Um, in the end, I got nine points out of it. Nine points from a favorite child to pick in round two, it seems not enough. Uh, but the, the problem I had, I didn't see myself doing a sanctuary before round six. So I, I didn't know when I would pick water one. And I felt like uh, since we were pretty much going for a two-town nomad game, I had to find some ways to get points. So that's, that's pretty much... Uh, what I thought, I thought TP rounds is next round, and then there's two dwellings round uh, that follow that. Uh, so I thought, let's get two trading posts uh, after water one round three, and then I'm pretty sure that I can get to uh, seven dwellings the following round, which which would work. Uh, but uh, in the end... Um, yeah, we uh, saw that you have a bunch of power in your bowls unused round after round, and I think if you get one more dig action, your game definitely looks different through the mid-game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, that's, I think I think in the end, uh, uh, after, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yeah, I think it was just a temporary little thing. Uh, all right, all right. So, uh, Mermaid crushed it, but uh, after Mermaids, I felt that I was relatively in control for the rest of the time. I mean, uh, it's it ended up being closer than I thought, but uh, I thought with the strong cold game, I, sh I should be all right, and it ended up working working fine. Gotcha. Well, I think uh, that wraps up our chat with you, Zoris. Thanks so much for joining us. Congrats again on advancing. Yeah, huge thanks congrats for having me. Uh, and again. Uh, thanks for thanks for, uh, production for this amazing tournament. Uh, looking forward to uh, to play in the final, and uh, this time this time it's gonna only be the first place that's gonna matter. That's right. No no second place by forty <laughs> points next time. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. All right. Take care, Zoros. Bye. All right. So. Any any last comments you'd like to make, Daniel, before we wrap this one up? Uh, you know, just one. Twitch.tv slash fire two tournaments. Follow, like, subscribe. Twitch.tv slash lumen underscore s for amazing Agricola content several days a week and all expert Terra Mystica commentary videos on the weekend. Everybody should jump on those opportunities. You know, there's a lot of great Terra Mystica content high level stuff that's been happening recently you know we want the community to keep uh growing and we want more players to become interested in playing time risk at a high level go check out those resources go check out zorus's twitch channel his youtube channel lots of amazing stuff there and yeah just really looking forward to the final this was a great game and that's it that's about it yeah absolutely so thank you all for watching this one with us it was a wonderful time hope you all enjoyed the experience in the chat uh, next game, the Ice Division Finals, semifinal number two, happening Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. I believe that's 7 or 8 p.m. Central European. Uh, right here, twitch.tv slash fire2tournaments, casted by the winner of this game, Gino, and uh, the third runner-up in this game, Claybo. It should be a wonderful time. So thank you all again. We will see you next time. Bye.